Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sheldon Brown. I'm the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination here at UCSD and a professor in the visual arts department. And um, I want to thank you all for coming here to um, help us uh, celebrate um, Galileo's birthday. And uh, so this started as a, a kind of little impromptu suggestion that we would throw a party for uh, Galileo. We're about a week, six days late, but uh, I don't think he minds. And, um, and so as this comes coming together, you know, we're celebrating the birthday of Galileo. Um, and I might also reframe it to say we're celebrating uh, the birthday of the scientist. And, um, and in a similar way to, as to how um, uh, uh, Aristotle was considered to be the philosopher, um, we might uh, consider Galileo to be to be this, to have that title of the scientist, as he's the one who codified the methods and ethos that has come to be the foundation of, of modern science. Um, and, and so as we are thinking about what we would do to celebrate this is, is to think about enjoying uh, the context out of which uh, helped to nurture Galileo and reflect um, on that context, or maybe I should say refract on that context, which is an inside joke that you will find hilarious in about two hours, <laughs> and, um, and, and how ideas that were a part of his time reverberate and unfold in our own times. Um, and so things that we think of as the methodologies and aims of science um, were quite different before and after Galileo. And in his work, he creates this method of experimental analysis um, and shows it as a way to, to see profound truths, um, which happen, and those truths just happen to sometimes upset understandings of reality that seemed perfectly adequate and reasonable and even cohesive and necessary to help uh, cohere particular worldviews. You know, so for Galileo, you know, it could have been asked why, um, why go to the bother of disproving these worldviews that seem to work quite fine. Um, and, you know, at best maybe it's kind of pointless to, um, to try to upset them. Um, and at worst, um, it could be, is considered heretical. Um, and of course the reason to bother to do this is that one description gets us closer to reality than the other. Um, and it might have taken us over 400 years to do, to do anything about some of his discoveries, um, but the search for a clearer view of the actual is a shift in the relationship between knowledge, culture, and society. Knowledge isn't pursued simply as a way to reify a particular worldview, but is built upon, but the worldview is built on a foundation of, of further understanding. And this is a tension that is still with us to this day. Um, now Galileo is in doing this in a time where change is occurring in all fields of culture and society around him. And I think it's notable that, that as he's developing, he's coming out of a, a, a musical environment. Um, Galileo's father was a renowned musician, composer, and theorist, and aspects of musical concepts um, seem to have a, have a fundamental influence on Galileo and his interests in things such as um, motion, time, patterns, gravity. Um, so at this time, there are these emerging, these very much more complex understandings and, and, and developments with music changes in harm, ideas about harmony, tempo, polyphony, um, coupled with the developments of new types of instruments. Um, and in our time, these are ideas that continue to evolve. Uh, music changes with every, with every cultural moment. And uh, we have new developments in how we start, how we're thinking about composition, temporality, and voice. So part of our program tonight is looking at these issues of Galileo's uh, 
musical origins and ways in which those kind of animate discussions of contemporary music. Now, one of the things that Galileo used that created such a fuss, this instrument of the refracting telescope, um, which was becoming known to a few people in his, in his time, um, was this powerful new tool of vision that showed our world in a, in, in, in a new light, or at least a, created a new relationship between our world and that light, that it now moved around it instead of it moved around us. Um, and that instrument continues to have uh, impact in how we peer deeper into our, rea into our reality and ask questions about our reality in this time. So we'll be looking at all these kinds of issues about the relationship of, of the science of Galileo's time, what brought him into formation, and some of the key components of his work. Um, so I want to thank, uh, give a few thanks before I at the beginning, because I, sometimes I forget at the end. Um, uh, but I want to thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities for sponsoring the Musicians in Ordinary, which is the um, uh, musical performance we're going to hear at the end of this. Um, I want to thank uh, Viasat, who's our founding partner of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Um, we have a founder's orbit of patrons that have helped make this program possible, along with the Clarke Center Foundation. And, um, and I want to thank the staff of the Clark Center who have uh, helped put this together. I also want to say that upcoming we have uh, pay attention to our website and Facebook and Twitter accounts, which uh, uh, are becoming more active all the time for upcoming events. We have a series of, of, of science, science and science fiction uh, uh, flicks that we'll be doing over the coming months, some of which I promise will be absolutely extraordinary, and you will, you will definitely want to come back for those. Um, and, uh, and as always, you know, check our website. There's a Donate Now button that I always have to, that's my main job, is to get people to press that button. Um, and so I'll give you a brief introduction to our speakers tonight. And the, and the videos, you'll, you'll, these movies will play at various times in, to, in today's program. There are um, a set of, of images you saw. We had some uh, images of, uh, of, of, of one of his uh, very important writings. And, um, and this is a, a, a view of what Galileo probably would have seen out of his telescope of Jupiter and his moons. And so we have a, a kind of a running program of uh, videos that look at how Galileo saw the sky and how now we can see the sky in extraordinary new ways uh, based on that. Um, so tonight, um, I'll, I'll introduce all the speakers right now so you kind of get a context of what the conversation is going to be. Um, so Jay Pasikoff is a field medal professor at, of astronomy at Williams College and the author of the Peterson Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, which many of us, I'm sure, have taken out into the field to try to uh, understand what it is we're looking at. Um, and um, as well as the co-author of the textbook, The Cosmos, and he's the chair of Historical Astronomy, Historical Astronomy Division of the American Astronomical Society. We also have Renee Raphael, who's an assistant professor of history at UC Irvine, who originally studied physics and mechanical engineering before doing her PhD in the history of science. Her research focuses on how Galileo's first readers evaluated and thought about his writings and discoveries. Brian Keating is an associate professor of physics and co-director of UCSD's Act Center for Experimental Cosmology. He got his physics and PhD, his PhD in physics from Brown University, and his team studies the early universe by building low noise sensors and deploying them on telescopes to the South Pole, Chile, and on suborbital -or NASA sounding rockets. Um, Stephanie Jed is the chair of the Department of Literature and a scholar of early modern Italy. She's the author of Chase Thinking, The Rape of Lucretia and the Birth of Humanism, and Wings of Our Courage, Gender, Erudition, and Republican Thought. Her multidisciplinary research and teaching explores the his social history of embodied cognition. And then we have Shlomo Dubnov, who graduated from the Jerusalem Music Academy in composition 
as well as got a doctorate in computer science from Hebrew University. Before coming to UCSD, he was a researcher at IRCAM in Paris and, Bel and Ben Gurion University in Israel. He does work on advanced audio processing and retrieval, computer generated music, and other multimedia applications. And at UCSD, he directs the Center for Research in Entertainment and Learning, teaching in the music and the interdisciplinary computing and the arts program. So many of the perspectives of our people tonight had come from bridging the fields of science and culture, um, as well as people who are deep, deeply invested in the history and the future of what we might be doing with, uh, with astronomy and the legacy of Galileo. So to start off, to start us off tonight, it's my pleasure to have Jay Pasikoff. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, to be invited by Brian and others to participate. Galileo, of course, is a land, represents a, a landmark astronomer, and uh, I want to place him in a bit of context and to, uh, let, let's see, where's the advancing? And, uh, and his work is, uh, is a landmark in the history of, of science as, he went, as people went from just being able to see with our eyes, with this little pupil a few millimeters across, to Galileo's telescope, and then eventually uh, to the Palomar telescope, not too far uh, from here, in which we had 200 inches of glass uh, funneling the light down to the eye or to a sensor. Galileo, of course, is very well known. Here we see him. Uh, front and center at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. I see Copernicus's uh, face on his right. It was also Copernicus's birthday this week. He would have been 521, not such a, a, round, a round number. But I do want to talk in my uh, 20 minutes about Galileo's work and put it in the context of the books that he wrote. We've already seen a copy of one of his important books uh, on the screen, and I'll come back to that. Uh, this is his image, is the frontispiece uh, of his book on, on sunspots from uh, 1613, which is a 400th anniversary that we've just had uh, in the past year. Just before the 400th anniversary of his turning a telescope to the heavens in 1609, the Museum of the History of Science in Florence was closed for renovation, and the telescopes came on a world tour. Uh, my wife and I were able to see a couple of his original telescopes that survive uh, at the Franklin Institute in, uh, in Philadelphia, where they had a, a very nice exhibit of, uh, of things from that time and several other things from, uh, from Galileo. And it was just a wonderful thing to be able to see the actual telescope that Galileo used. In fact, I asked the, uh, the person who gave a talk about it from the museum there whether they were going to sample DNA uh, from the front of the telescope because you see that stop around the edge inside to get rid of the aberrations of the edge of the lens. Galileo obviously adjusted that and what, what we could do with uh, Galileo's DNA. I don't know that we want to clone Galileo, but, <laughs> but we're making advances in, in, in that science, certainly. Um, I've been participating in a series of meetings on the inspiration of astronomical phenomena. We had one in Venice uh, that year in 1609, we couldn't resist uh, going to this meeting in Venice, which you can see out the window and at the top of the Campanile, and there's the back of my wife's head. Those of you in the audience can also see the back of my wife's head in, <laughs> in, in row two. Uh, the meeting was opened by the Pope, and they got special permission to put this plaque up in the, up in the Campanile, uh, where we're here uh, for the 400th anniversary of Galileo opened, uh, uh, opened the world to humanity. I want to talk mainly today about the book Sidereus Nuncius. You've already seen some of these pages on the big screen uh, here. Uh, you can see the emphasis on the Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger at the top, then Galileo Galilei, he identified with being from Florence. The perspiculi is what they then called what we now call a telescope. He tried to name the stars after the Prince of the, Medi of the Medici, um, and we still you call those stars and significant things, we call them the Galilean satellites now, the, uh, 
it didn't, his flattering the Prince of the Medici did work though in that he got invited uh, to go back down to Florence for tenure and more money as many academics uh, try to move for and that was a disastrous move for him because it brought him close to the Inquisition. He would have been much better off staying in Padua and Florence. But in any case, you can see 1610 there before his publication. Uh, and here's his dedication to the, uh, the prince. Um, and uh, well, he did have his refracting telescope. He did not invent the telescope. He had heard that there was a device that could make things closer. In fact, at about the same time, uh, there was an Englishman who pointed his telescope at the sky and he looked at the moon and just did some little blotches. Whereas Galileo was, we heard that he was in the, in the Renaissance for music, but he was in the Renaissance for art, and he knew about light and shadow. And as my colleague at Williams College, Sam Edgerton, has pointed out, it was this being immersed in uh, Renaissance Italy uh, that led him to be able to interpret uh, images like this in terms of lunar seas and in terms of mountains on the uh, what we call the terminator, the, the difference between light and dark, and you see some craters there. When the Library of Congress got its first Siderius Nuncius uh, a couple of years ago, and we heard a symposium by the uh, Princeton librarian Paul Needham, uh, he and I started working on trying to identify exactly which mountain range uh, Galileo saw. Uh, and you have to know, to, to interpret these things properly, you need the right phase of the moon, but also the right angle, what's called libration, for looking around the top and bottom of the moon. So uh, we didn't succeed in our observations in Hawaii that matched, but now there are NASA spacecraft observations from the Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory. And I'm working with uh, someone at NASA's got a space flight center uh, in order to try to identify just what it is that Galileo saw. Uh, Galileo made some drawings that we have and then undoubtedly told the engraver here uh, there was a big crater uh, because this crater is uh, not in the right size relative to what it really is, uh, we can say that Galileo was interested in the science, but not so much the cartography. So he was emphasizing the features that you see in the moon, but not necessarily where they were uh, on the moon. And here uh, is an example of a recreation uh, of the, uh, well, with the, with the Goddard scientists that we can use to try to match to what Galileo saw. And you can see the things sticking up over the Terminator uh, and we're trying to identify the right mountain ranges there. And we have a couple of different days, 30th of November, 1609, or the 2nd of December, 1609. Uh, in any case, uh, Galileo devoted a lot of his book in early 1610 to these studies of the moon and uh, looked at it at different uh, angles of lighting and tried to see what was going on with it, but made the important observation that was not completely accepted right away, and we'll hear more about that in a little while, um, that the moon was imperfect. It wasn't this beautiful crystalline sphere out, uh, out in space. He also pointed his telescope at the Milky Way and so it was made out of stars. In the upper right, you can see the constellation, the Pleiades. It's an asterism, really, not a whole constellation, but he saw many more stars uh, than was known there. The Orion Nebula, he saw lots of stars. Couldn't see the gas we now see. Praesepe is, an, is the Beehive Nebula. And then, <clears throat> in early uh, 1610, he saw these little stars going around uh, Jupiter, and he was intrigued by them, and he noticed that they moved uh, with respect to Jupiter. Sometimes they were all on one side, sometimes some were on one side, some on the other. And he really got carried away. Uh, the rest of the book, the second half of the book, are these, uh, all these images of the uh, Medicean stars, so-called, the Galilean satellites going, uh, uh, going around Jupiter. Uh, but it was the very important scientific point that the Earth did not have to be the only place in the universe, in the solar system, uh, around which everybody went, all the other celestial objects went, around which everything went. Uh, and so this really endorsed Copernicus's point of view that it was the uh, sun rather than the earth that the solar system or at least freed us from having everything uh, going around the earth. And you can see really he got carried away. There's a Monty Python movie where the, the credits get hijacked by moose and uh, the rest of the credits are all in favor of moose. And this is really what happened to Siderius Nuncius with, uh, with Galileo. But you see he uh, first called them the, uh, after Cosmo, the Cosmica stars, and then he changed it to the Medicean 
stars. And there was a very interesting episode in the last few years I want to touch on briefly. Some of you may have seen an article in the New Yorker uh, from the middle of December uh, in which uh, uh, it is described how a very strange, beautiful copy of the Sidereus Nuncius uh, came available. Um, and it, it, did, it had drawings instead of those engravings, and it had Galileo's signature on the bottom. It um, was clearly very valuable, and they tried to authenticate it. It had a beautiful stamp from the Lynx, uh, showing the Lynx Society there on, uh, on the left. And the uh, rare book dealer, um, uh, Richard Lyon from New York, uh, took it around. And at one point, my copy on the left uh, went with, with him and his copy on the right to the Houghton Library at Harvard. And we paged through to try to see if there were any, uh, any differences. Uh, in fact, there is one little difference that that one can get up, uh, up a little uh, higher, just above the Mediterranean stars. Uh, but it wasn't known quite what to make of it. It was really uh, authenticated by the major uh, student of this period of, of book. And the idea was that it was a proof copy, a very rare copy, and a very valuable copy with Galileo's own uh, drawings in it. So whenever there was a little difference, you could make the case that it was supposed to be different, because it was this special proof, uh, proof copy. And uh, in fact, this, uh, this scholar, Horst Bredekamp, wrote a whole uh, couple of volumes called Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius and Galileo's O from that, uh, from that big O, and concluded, on the basis of our analyses, our research proves some crucial points. The New York Sidereus Nuncius is not a margin forgery. But as this article shows and tells the story, in fact, it is a modern forgery. Um, the uh, forger actually went to the extent of buying uh, a paper-making plant to make paper with the, right, um, uh, with the right watermarks on it. And there were just some little differences, and, uh, including some careful work that Owen Gingrich at Harvard did, that one of the pictures of the moon was too close to publication to have really been done uh, at that time. So it's a very interesting story. I recommend that story. Uh, to you in the December 19th in New Yorker. Here we see comparisons, for example, of, of some of the, uh, the images from various copies that are known to be right. Uh, Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Linda Hole Library in Kansas City, my copy uh, now in Williamstown, Massachusetts at the bottom, and the Sidereus Nuncius from Matian Lan, the, uh, the top copy. Uh, the uh, Lynx stamp. Uh, proved to be a copy of, uh, of another one that, uh, that was located in the signature is just a forgery. Uh, and uh, so Paul Needham put together this, this talk of Sidereus Nuncius Fossilicus. Of course, the Sidereus Nuncius is in, it is in Latin, uh, and that is one of the things that led him publish his, his results uh, without, uh, without interference. And it was later on in 1632 when he published his Dialogo in Italian um, that, in, that people could understand, uh, that really uh, got him in trouble. But in any case, people have been comparing all these signatures, comparing all these things on the, uh, on the page. Uh, the uh, broken type on the left in the Institute for Advanced Study copy did not appear in this uh, Sidereus Nuncius that Matian Lan had. And uh, so one has to look through the whole book for little differences like this and figure out how the, the plates uh, uh, vary. And, and here you can see in the forgery on the top and my copy on the right, I was relieved to see, but I've had my copy for 30 years at least, so this is before the forger came in. If you look in the second line, the, the first, of the, um, the, first of, the, of the smaller type, at the right it says atke periodis at the bottom, and it says pepiodis, and plus a ligature and the P and the I, which never have a real ligature on the right. And that's one of the key things, uh, proving it's a forgery, which might have been left in on purpose by the, the forger, uh, so he could always prove what beautiful work he did. Uh, in any case, uh, Galileo went on in, in 1613 uh, to, uh, uh, to do a book on the Machi Solari. You see line three, the, uh, the solar sunspots. You see the links. There, the Society of the Lynx, a, a constellation with stars so faint that you need the eyes of a lynx to, uh, to see it. And, uh, and so he went on to uh, draw the, uh, the sunspots. It's been controversial whether he went blind because he did so much solar observing. Uh, most people seem to think now 
uh, that, that it was a, a normal age-related uh, blindness that went on, because he was projecting the image. He was probably pretty careful on it. This was years later. But in any case, he has these beautiful drawings of the, uh, of the uh, sunspots, and, uh, and then a lot more drawings of the positions of the moons of Jupiter uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this book. Galileo uh, w was very active and vocal. In fact, his work on sunspots uh, proved part of his uh, downfall because he disagreed with uh, one of the Jesuits in particular on the priority for the discovery of sunspots. Galileo was quite uh, outspoken in blaming his, uh, his priority. Uh, and he was uh, held and uh, prevented, brought on trial uh, in, in 1616 and kept from, and told not to teach Copernicanism uh, anymore, and he managed to keep himself quiet for, uh, for, uh, quite, uh, for quite some years. But by 1632, he couldn't uh, keep himself quiet anymore, and he wrote this uh, dialogue, the Dialogo of Galileo Galilei uh, there, and uh, Pt uh, Ptolemy, whose work he's partly overthrowing is the, is the middle finger, and Copernicus uh, on the right. Uh, Copernicus holds a, a kind of a staff that's uh, that's typical of, uh, of him, and their names are, are written on the hem, and Galileo's face is used in, for Aristotle and the figure on the left in this, uh, in this first edition. And as I mentioned before, uh, the Dialogo was, uh, was written in uh, Italian, so the, the people could, uh, could uh, read this and see the argument that he uh, was putting out. One of the three characters was called Simplicio, uh, which we think of as a, as a simpleton. It didn't have quite as negative a connotation at the time. But nonetheless, it was uh, surely not wise for Galileo to put words that the pope had spoken uh, into, uh, into the, uh, that character on the, on the page. And Pope Urban, who'd been a friend of Galileo and um, has been, um, well, reversed himself and did not back Galileo in, uh, instead uh, of uh, Galileo's receiving the protection of the pope at that point. He lost the protection of that pope, was uh, sentenced to uh, house arrest, where he stayed for another, uh, well, 10 years after Dialogo was published. His trial was, uh, uh, was a year after that. And uh, he did work uh, while he was under house arrest. He wrote a he wrote some uh, major book. He was in touch with his, his daughter, uh, as some of you know who've, who has read the Galileo's daughter correspondence that uh, David Sobel uh, interestingly put. Uh, but uh, his, he became renowned uh, all over the world for the work he had done. He did correspond in the early 1600s with Johannes Kepler, uh, but it was more or less a one-way uh, correspondence and that Galileo did not always respond, did not mostly uh, respond. And Galileo uh, had the ideas of things like momentum early on, had the idea of the pendulum from his earlier work in Pisa, uh, had the idea that there are many more stars in the sky uh, that, um, uh, that he saw with his telescope, uh, importantly saw that Venus with a telescope went through a whole series of phases. Uh, which could not be matched with the Ptolemaic view of the universe, which would have had just, uh, just a partial series of phases because Venus would always be on the side of the sun uh, facing, uh, facing the Earth. Um, and, uh, but uh, ultimately, the, uh, the basic work of Galileo and the methods that he worked out went into the laws of planetary motion that were worked out with Kepler, and then eventually uh, those laws were worked out uh, theoretically by Isaac Newton uh, later in the, in the 17th century. It is very fitting that we, uh, that we commemorate Galileo on this 450th birthday. Uh, we've been privileged to see a number of uh, aspects of his celebrated. We're going to hear some of the music of his father later on. Uh, my wife and I were glad to see the opera Galileo by Philip Glass uh, performed uh, a few years ago. And, uh, and Galileo is, is truly celebrated in song and story and fable. Thank you very much for inviting me to tell you some things about him.
Thank you, Jay. And is, is this, uh, Jay, is this? Yes. Thanks. And just, uh, I, I, I may not have actually explained the format, I'm sitting here thinking. But we'll, we'll have everyone talk, and then at, at the end, we'll have a panel. So think, think of the, you know, your insightful questions that will get at the heart of the matter here. And, um, and then we'll have a break while we set up for the musical performance. Um, so now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Rene Raphael to come up, and we'll hear more about Galileo's context. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to address the question of um, who was Galileo in his own time, but I'll start um, briefly by asking who is Galileo today. Um, so for many people, um, he's remembered for his defense of Copernicanism, for his defense of um, a sun-centered universe, or, um, and his eventual condemnation by the Catholic Church in 1633. For people that think about Galileo in this way, uh, we think of him as an icon representing sort of a defense of science and reason against the forces of a blind religious faith. Um, for some people, um, he's a figure in an introductory physics textbook. You might learn about Galileo dropping balls off towers. You might learn about um, sort of mistakenly named Galilean transformation. Um, others learn of Galileo um, through talks like this one or through visits to museums, uh, like this one in Florence, which you heard about in the first talk. Um, appropriately now renamed the Galileo Museum. Um, here, visitors from all over the world come to marvel at Galileo's genius and the physical objects that he created and touched, including his surviving telescopes. Uh, for those who are especially morbid or dedicated, uh, you can also admire his finger, which was cut from his body and preserved, uh, much as was done with saints' relics in the ancient and medieval world. Um, for, so for the modern person, uh, Galileo symbolizes many things, scientist, physicist, astronomer, culture icon, defender of reason against superstition. Uh, but today I want to ask us to think about what Galileo represented to people in the decades after he died in 1642. How did they view his contributions to science and his clash with the Catholic Church? Um, and historians usually try to talk about how different the past was than today. But today I will show that in some ways um, Gal in the 17th century um, was a symbol representing many of the things we think of today though in slightly different guises. Um, some people also look to him in terms of how to define the correct relationship between science and religion, um, how to best understand how to conduct um, a scientific inquiry, and also as an icon representing cultural achievement. And so for many Europeans in the 17th century, Galileo was an advocate of a new approach to scientific thinking and one who needed to be protected um, from the Catholic Church and whose works needed to be disseminated, even though the Catholic Church was trying to suppress them. Um, and one of his biggest fans was a man named Marin Mersenne, who was actually a French Catholic priest um, who lived in Paris. Um, though Mersenne was Catholic, he was a proponent of new ways of thinking, and he was friends with many of the most innovative thinkers of his time. You might have heard um, from many, of many of these people, um, including Rene Descartes, mathematician Pierre Fermat. And Mersenne had hoped to include Galileo in a circle of correspondence. Um, he wrote several letters to him and also sent him copies of his own books and those of other acquaintances. Um, but Galileo never responded. Um, he told friends that Mersenne's handwriting was impossible to read. Um, some people have excused this by saying that Galileo you know, was losing his eyesight. Um, but the fact is that Mersenne's, Mersenne's handwriting is very difficult to read. You can see some of it here. Um, I can ask expert French paleographers, and they often have a very difficult time with it. So we might be able to excuse Galileo's lack of enthusiasm, because he really did have a hard time reading it. Okay. Um, so undeterred, though, Mersenne went about promoting Galileo on his own. Um, he got his hands on an unpublished manuscript of Galileo's. Uh, without asking permission, he translated it into French and published it on his own with the title, The Mechanics of Galileo. Um, he assembled the reactions of other French scholars to Galileo's 1632 dialogue, uh, the work for which Galileo was condemned, and then he forwarded all their reactions to Galileo so that Galileo could respond, which um, he did not. Um, Mersenne shared the news of Galileo's condemnation with his correspondence, and he offered again and again to help Galileo 
share his views in France. Um, and in the last few years of Galileo's life, um, Mersenne used his extensive network of correspondence to keep tabs on Galileo's final publication project, uh, which was published in 1638 and had to be published in the Netherlands because Galileo by this time had been condemned and was not allowed to publish anything in Italy. Um, through these networks, uh, Mersenne managed, it seems, to let the printers see part of the work before it was printed. And within a year of its publication, he published his own version of the text, uh, which he translated into French, uh, sort of summarized and condensed, and then added his own comments, saying when he agreed or when Galileo had made a mistake. Um, so today we might think that Mersenne's actions went overboard. Um, he published versions of Galileo's treatise without permission. Um, he was perhaps overly aggressive in trying to secure Galileo's friendship and promote his name. Um, however, while Mersenne was unusual even in the 17th century, we should remember that our notions of copyright and intellectual property weren't the same then as they are now. And we can think of Mersenne in some ways like a 17th century internet, helping to facilitate a flow of information ideas across Europe. And learning about Galileo's findings and fate did shape the way, the way other philosophers approached their own work. Uh, Rene Descartes, the French philosopher and mathematician, um, who made the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am, um, reacted strongly both to Galileo's ideas and his condemnation. Um, in response to Galileo's two new sciences, um, this is the work that contains Galileo's findings about pendulums, about um, objects falling all with the same speed. Um, Descartes was not um, very much impressed. He wrote, uh, generally speaking, I find that Galileo philosophizes much more ably than usual but he continually digresses and does not take time to explain matters fully. This, in my view, is a mistake. It shows that he is not investigator's manners, matters in an orderly way and has merely sought explanations of some particular effects without going into the primary causes in nature. Hence, his building, his physics, his philosophy lacks a foundation. Okay. Um, but despite these quibbles with Galileo's philosophizing method, um, Descartes knew that Galileo was very well known, um, and he was shocked when he heard the news of Galileo's condemnation. Um, so Descartes was himself from a noble family, but he was not as well connected as Galileo. Um, so he wrote, when he learned of the condemnation, um, he wrote a letter to Mersenne saying that he intended to send Mersenne a copy of his new treatise, The World, as a New Year's gift. Um, but he says, but I have to say that in the meantime, I took the trouble to inquire in Leiden and Amsterdam whether Galileo's dialogue on the two world systems was available. I was told that it had indeed been published, but all the copies had immediately been burned in Rome and that Galileo had been convicted and fined. I was so astonished at this that I almost decided to burn all my papers, or at least to let no one see them, for I could not imagine that he, an Italian, and as I understand in the good graces of the Pope, could have been made a criminal for any other reason than that he tried, as he no doubt did, to establish that the earth moves. Um, and Descartes was very much affected by this news. He actually suppressed the publication of this treatise, The World, and it didn't come out until after he died, and then made the rest of his publication so that he did not seem um, to be endorsing the Copernican system. Um, so strongly. Um, closer to home, Galileo's fame and fate had a great impact on those that had known him personally. Um, one of these was a young student named Vincenzo Viviani, um, who came to study and learn from Galileo after his condemnation. Um, at this point, Galileo was blind and under house arrest, um, living in this house outside of Florence. Um, this would have been one of the views that Galileo could have seen, although Galileo couldn't see at this time. Um, Viviani helped Galileo with the projects that occupied his final days, um, especially the writing and the publishing of the two new sciences. And in fact, we even have today uh, notes that Viviani took in the margins of the book. Um, and some of these he took while he was studying along with Galileo. And then one thing you'll see as the talk goes on, you see that people in the 17th century, uh, they were told to write in their books, not like we are today. So the librarians today, well, we are very grateful we have these, but it's always surprising, I think, to, for people to see who were writing so much in their books. Okay. Um, so after Galileo's death, uh, Viviani was determined to honor the memory of his beloved teacher, but he was also a perfectionist. Um, he embarked on many projects, but because he wanted to make them perfect, few were finished in his lifetime. Uh, one of the first things he set out to do was to collect all of Galileo's papers and letters. Um, he wanted to publish a huge volume filled with all of Galileo's published writings and then all of these letters that he had. Um, writing to friends and acquaintances across Europe, um, Viviani was especially concerned to promote the image of Galileo as a good Catholic and scientist, and so he instructed friends to look for these letters, um, but to take care that letters that put Galileo in a bad light um, would not be circulated. And what Viviani managed to collect 
um, is now housed today at the National Library of Florence, um, and also forms the basis of the collected works of Galileo known as the National Edition, which comprises 20 very big volumes. Um, but once collected by Viviani, these papers had a tough time of it. Uh, Viviani's descendants were less than eager than he had been to preserve the scribbles of Galileo, uh, many of which look like this one here. Um, so some of his descendants began selling off these papers in small bundles as sandwich wrapping paper. Um, luckily, one well-learned customer looked more closely at the paper um, in which his bologna sandwich was wrapped um, in the 18th century, hurried back to the shop, and rescued all of these papers for us today. Um, as for Viviani's aspirations for this commemorative edition, uh, the only thing he managed to see into fruition uh, was a two-volume set, which you see here, uh, which contained only things that had been previously published, so none of the letters. Um, and Viviani was not even allowed to put in the dialogue or any writings discussing Copernicus. And so Viviani complained about this work. He said it was poor quality um, and didn't live up to any misexpectations. Um, but Viviani did have other projects up his sleeve. Um, he set out to publish his own biography of Galileo, um, one which he also did not manage to publish before he died. Uh, but he labored over the project for many years, uh, recording his own reminiscences of Galileo and stories of his early life. Uh, many of the details that Viviani included in his account are ones that are very familiar us, with us for us today. Um, for example, Viviani recounted um, that a lamp hanging in the cathedral at Pisa inspired Galileo's experiments with the pendulum, um, and that Galileo had experimented with freefall by dropping balls off the Tower of Pisa. Um, unfortunately, uh, many historians also think that these stories are fiction, um, perhaps based in fact, perhaps not. So things, certain things have been dated. For example, the lamp at Pisa was put in too late for Galileo to have actually been inspired by it. Um, and one of Viviani's final projects was an attempt to have a monumental tomb celebrating Galileo placed in Santa Croce, uh, one of Florence's great cathedrals, which already housed many of the city's illustrious citizens, including Dante and Michelangelo. Um, Galileo's will had specified that he be buried um, in the church beside the tombs of his father and other ancestors um, in the Basilica of Santa Croce. And on the day after his death, um, Galileo's body was moved to the basilica without any pomp or ceremony. Uh, it was accompanied by his son and other members of his family, uh, the priest and a few of Galileo's students, including Viviani. Uh, but neither the Grand Duke nor any other important official attended the event, and it is likely that Florentine officials feared um, that officials from Rome might decide to issue sort of a formal prohibition um, on bearing Galileo's remains in the church. And in fact, Galileo's body was initially placed not even in the family tomb, um, but concealed in a tiny chamber. Um, this is where it was originally held under the bell tower. Um, but what Viviani hoped to do was create a huge honorary tomb directly across from Michelangelo, one which would demonstrate um, and honor Galileo as a pious Catholic and a great Florentine citizen. Um, Viviani went so far as to commission his own bronze bust for the tomb, one which was based on a clay model made from Galileo's death, ma death mask. Um, however, his efforts were in vain. Uh, the Pope refused to grant Galileo, a condemned man, such an honorary burial. And so undeterred, um, Viviani completed the plans for the monument and specified in his will that his beneficiaries carry out the project of building it. And on his own, Viviani decided to honor Galileo privately. Um, he had an architect friend um, transform the facade of his own palace in Florence into a structure documenting and celebrating the extraordinary intellectual achievements of Galileo. So at the center of the monument, he put this bust of Galileo that he had had commissioned, um, and then he placed these scrolls alongside it, um, which summarized Galileo's principal achievements in astronomy and mechanics. I um, mean, this was the first memorial um, to Galileo that was visible in a public place in Florence. And only after Viviani's death in 1737 um, was permission granted to rebury Galileo. Um, his body was moved to a new location in Santa Croce and an honorary tomb erected, which you can visit today. Here it is. Um, and it was during this time that parts of Galileo's bodies were removed in the style of saint's relics. Um, so this is when the finger came off of Galileo's body. Okay. Um, so other individuals were also eager to hold up Galileo as an example to be remembered, uh, but not always in the same way as had Mersenne and Viviani. Um, the Society of Jesus uh, was a religious order that had had its start in 1534. Um, only about 100 years before Galileo's trial. And the Society of Jesus was part of the Catholic Church's efforts to push back against the tide of Protestantism. And one of the main tactics that the Jesuits used, um, both then and now, um, was education. 
Uh, they carried out original research, they published books, and they opened colleges across the globe where they offered a free education to all denominations. And one enterprising Jesuit named Giovanni Battista Riccioli was eager to tackle the issues raised by Galileo's condemnation head on. Um, so, ah, sorry, this is Riccioli's term. He petitioned the order to read Galileo's forbidden 1632 dialogue. Um, and he got permission to dedicate himself to writing a huge compendium of astronomy, which he titled The New Almagest. Um, in the work, Riccioli addressed over 100 arguments concerning the heliocentric system and took on Galileo's evidence, at times agreeing with him and at times not. Um, in the end, Riccioli, as a good Jesuit, upholded the church's opinion that the Earth was at rest in the center of the universe. And to bolster this opinion, Riccioli reprinted the entirety of the Catholic Church's decree against Galileo in his book. Um, Supporters, other supporters of Galileo, like Viani, were very angry with this move. Um, but Riccioli was probably not trying to cast Galileo in a bad light. Um, rather, he was trying to sort of teach correct doctrine um, and present students what they needed to know about Galileo and what one should do with astronomy. Okay. Uh, Riccioli's treatment of Galileo in his published book mirrors what was taught in Jesuit classrooms. Um, so one of the things that I do is I go to archives and look at old teaching notes. Uh, There's actually some notes from an, um, an old from a Jesuit professor in the 17th century. And you find that in these classrooms, these Jesuit professors um, talked about Galileo and taught his ideas. Um, they admired him for the use of his telescope and for his discovery of the moons of Jupiter. But they also held up Galileo as an example of what um, not to do. Um, so students were instructed over and over again in various passages that Galileo was a Copernican. And because he did not listen to the decrees of 1616 and 1633, um, he had been condemned by the Catholic Church. As students were to learn about the Copernican system um, as their Jesuit professors taught it to them, but they were to remember the example of Galileo um, and never think that you should endorse the model as a true one as Galileo had done. Um, students in the 17th century also used Galileo's work in ways that may seem strange to us today. Um, one student at the University of Pisa named Anton Maria Salvini, for example, took a copy of Galileo's 1638 Two New Sciences, um, which had been written mainly in Italian, and he translated it in his notes into Latin. Um, Salvini was perhaps perfecting his linguistic talents, for he later would be named a professor of philology at Pisa. Um, an unknown reader, apparently so enamored of the same book, copied out most of the text himself, which you see here, and then added his own elaborately colored illustrations to his manuscript. Um, finally, there were other readers who used Galileo's books as mathematical exercise books. They followed along in the margins as Galileo worked out mathematical proofs regarding how bodies move, um, and at times they offered new solutions to Galileo's problems. Um, even very famous readers of Galileo um, did this as well. So you can see some examples of Mersenne doing this, working through problems. Uh, Galileo student Viviani did the same thing. Um, even uh, Christopher Wren. Um, the English architect um, who's responsible for redesigning St. Paul's Cathedral um, did the same thing in his book. So his book, you can find it at the library in Oxford. Um, it's filled with him trying to work through Galileo's problems. And what's interesting is it looks as if he didn't do this on his own, but he worked with an older professor named Seth Ward. And throughout the book, you can see that um, Christopher Wren just completely copied from Seth Ward. So it's like they're learning mathematics um, by reading Galileo together. Okay. Um, so thus we see that 17th century students and readers of Galileo um, saw th him through lenses which were similar yet different to our own. Um, in both cases, then and now, some people saw Galileo as a symbol of relationship between science and religion. Um, for some, he was a cultural icon representing scientific achievement. And others learned him through the guise of pedagogy, um, learning about Galileo's name, his achievements, or writings um, through school textbooks or books they used as school textbooks. Thank you. And now we'll um, move from the 17th century to the uh, 21st century and uh, look at ways in which uh, Galileo's instruments are still, uh, some of those same methods are still providing new ways of understanding where we are. Okay, it's really nice to be here celebrating Galileo's 450th birthday. It reminded me of another person uh, known for, for lenses. Can we get the um, other adapter up? Okay. 
So another person known for his lenses, and that's Woody Allen, when asked, what does he want people to say about him 100 years from now? And he said, I want them to say that I look pretty good for a 150-year-old person. <laughs> and so we're celebrating his life and, and achievements. And, and, and what I'd like to argue is that, that the invention of the telescope, perhaps more than any other scientific tool, changed the world. Uh, and it, it not only changed the world of science and our perspective on, on, our, on the universe, literally and figuratively, but also has deep reaching cultural implications, as we just heard from Rene. Uh, and, uh, and throughout history, uh, since, since the invention of this magical instrument, which we're still perfecting to this day, um, he's, he's had perhaps the most broad reaching influence. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the quest for our understanding of the universe and its origin. And this is a woodcut from the 1600s, it's been uh, colorized using Photoshop in the 20th century. Uh, and it really depicts the quest that Galileo was on and others were on to really perceive what's beyond this cosmic veil that we, that we are presented with, this fixed dome of the stars that it appears to be surrounding us. What's beyond it? And this is something Galileo really first introduced to us uh, with an instrument other than our eyeballs. Uh, astronomy is perhaps the oldest science, uh, being that we can do it with our eyes uh, and, and our brains and we can look up at the night sky and be mesmerized, as all of us are. Um, and Galileo is able to, to use this, this, this device to really gain further insight into the universe than had ever been, um, been, been possible before. So, uh, so this is a modern, uh, this is just from last week on his birthday, all this uh, came out at the same time, sponsored by our modern day Medici's, which is the National Science Foundation. I make sure to never give them the finger, uh, as Galileo did. Um, and, and this study showed that uh, something like uh, three quarters uh, of, uh, of Americans, or sorry, one quarter of Americans still don't ha have the word that the, uh, that the Earth is going around the sun and not the other way around. Uh, and, and yet, uh, and yet this, is, this, is, uh, this is quite embarrassing in many ways, but, but in reality, it, it reflects kind of a deep, and, and I like the way the author here t attempts to, to make us feel better by saying, well, in Europe, it's even worse, so uh, don't feel so bad, which, which is the, uh, a slight offense to the, our European uh, colleagues and friends. So what are we trying to do? Like that, that the beautiful woodcut, uh, what we're trying to do is really make a space-time diagram. We're trying to go back as far as we can with vision. And it turns out you can, you can only go back with, with visible light or electromagnetic waves only so far. You can't go back to the actual beginning because there's something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, this rainbow pattern that we see here. And that rainbow pattern presents an opaque screen, like a, like a metallic screen, uh, beyond which we cannot see using radiation of any kind. That's completely opaque. The same way a mirror is opaque, you can't look through a mirror. So what we attempt to do is actually see the imprint of the earlier epoch, the actual spark I call, that ignited the hot Big Bang, the Big Bang that we now observe and know to be true. And we use a, a refractor, just like Galileo did, to really understand our origins. And I'll describe what it's like to do that. Um, but first, I want to give just, just a little bit of um, uh, an intro uh, and, and give, give a sense of the magnitude of how challenging this is for us to do. So here's an image of this photosphere, this cosmic microwave background, this opaque screen beyond which, as I said, we can no longer uh, use electromagnetic rays to, to see through. Um, so here's this, this, this uh, pattern. This was produced about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, expressed conveniently in seconds as uh, 10 trillion seconds. Um, and if we want to go farther back in time to the actual be beginning of time, time equals zero, we actually can't do that. Uh, but we, we hope to be able to use a technology that, that my team has invented to probe this epoch of the universe when it was not zero seconds old, if you will, but a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after its existence, uh, after it came into existence. And that's an epoch called inflation. Inflation is described as a purely quantum mechanical description of space and time. It means that ordinary quantum mechanics, or classical mechanics rather, does not apply. The scales that Galileo probed has no application at any scale back at the beginning of time, back at this, this very, very rapid uh, period of inflation which occurred right after the Big Bang. So we're trying to divine from this pattern that occurred 10 to the 13 seconds, 10 trillion seconds after the Big Bang, what this was like 50 orders of magnitude earlier in time. It's quite uh, a large challenge to do. And to give you a sense of the magnitude of this problem, so, so if you look at this object here, which my biologist uh, colleagues will, will uh, correct me on uh, uh, what it's called, but I believe it's called a blastocyst, and it's about uh, what, you, what you looked like about 1,000 seconds after your parents got together um, and conceived you, and it's about 1,000 cells or so that will make up the human body later on. 
So imagine you're looking at this, uh, you want to divine the properties of what this object, what this creature, what this uh, future creature would look like by looking at the way it looks today. So, so here we are, we, we see our esteemed chancellor, uh, Pradeep Kaushla, when he was about a billion seconds old, you can calculate how many seconds a billion is, um, how many years that is rather, uh, maybe I'm being generous. Um, uh, but imagine trying to do this. Now, that would be impossible, right? We, we would think that this is utterly nonsense, that you could look at him today and say, oh, that's what he looked like. I think he looks like his father here. Um, <laughs> but if you're going back in time and attempting to do that, and you'd see that this is only a factor of a million, only a factor of a million in time. So to go back 50 orders of magnitude is just incomprehensible, and yet that's exactly what we're doing with the telescope I'm going to describe. First, I want to briefly just describe what is the cosmic microwave background radiation. It was discovered by Penzias and Wilson in northern New Jersey, one of the few things that uh, we've learned about the universe from New Jersey. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, so I'm entitled to it. Uh, so they used this telescope at the former Bell Laboratories, which was actually using the internet of the 1960s. We didn't know, you don't know it, but there was an internet back then, and this was it. This was a satellite called the Telstar satellite, and they tried to communicate, as Bell Labs was wont to do, and they couldn't get away from this irrepressible static that was filling their antenna. This was actually a radio telescope. They were actually radio astronomers hired by Bell Labs to understand the noise properties of why they couldn't get this perfectly uh, pure signal from the satellite. And it turns out the reason why is because the universe is emitting static at all wavelengths, and that's contaminating and overwhelming to some extent the signal from the satellite. Now, this was the entire internet. So imagine, you know, when your kids are on the, on the internet at home and they're slowing down your bandwidth, you get mad at them. Imagine if they were slowing down the bandwidth of the entire world's internet. It was a huge problem technologically, financially. The satellite in today's dollars would be hundreds of billions of dollars. It had to be solved. They found that they couldn't escape from this hiss, static, another thing that kids today don't understand. I say, you know static on your, th like, what are you talking about? My students will say, static? I don't have any static on my cable HDTV. Uh, but yet, if you do have an old-fashioned TV and you turn it between the channels, about 1% of the static that you're receiving on that channel, or between those channels, comes from the universe itself. So if you look at that pattern and then you remove this constant 3 Kelvin, or 2.726 degree, uh, ab above absolute zero signal, you're left with this astonishing imprint of microscopic fluctu fluctuations. Uh, that were predicted by uh, my recently passed colleague, uh, Professor Art Wolf, who passed away earlier this week. Uh, he predicted, uh, as part of his doctoral thesis, that there should be fluctuations in the background that had just been discovered by Penzias and Wilson a few years earlier. So it looked completely uniform, and this was astonishing, except what was predicted by Art Wolf was that there should be microscopic fluctuations. How big are these fluctuations? Well, here's what they look like today on the whole sky. Uh, this is a measurement by the WMAP satellite. Um, and this fluctuation size corresponds to a one part in 100,000 fluctuation of the 3 Kelvin background, which is already very low. How small is a fluctuation of one part in 100,000? Well, I'm not a good bowler, but if I did bowl, uh, my bowling ball would look a lot more ratty than this one does. But the bowling ball has fluctuations on it. I've exaggerated them here. The smoothness of a bowling ball is only one part in 10,000. So the fluctuations on the microwave background are 10 times smaller in amplitude, and yet we've measured them over the whole sky. And what my team is doing is trying to measure what causes these fluctuations. Art Wolf predicted if they exist, what would they look like on the sky? What I'm trying to do is to understand how was the mechanism responsible for it? How did that come into play? And that's called inflation. So I want to take a detour as we're talking about this, this technology that revolutionized the world, not just of science, but, but of all things. Uh, and you want, when you want to design a telescope, we ask ourselves, well, what are you looking for? What is really the science that you're going after? And you don't want to build too big a telescope uh, than you actually need. So Galileo's telescope uh, was like a, less than this size in diameter, and it's refractive just like this water bottle is, the water inside. So you first start to decide, well, what are you looking for? So Galileo, this is the Hubble Deep Field image, which is very uh, familiar to people. This is a beautiful image made by a reflecting telescope. And it shows essentially every speck of light that you see here, with the exception of this star, this star, and one or two other stars, every single speck other than those is a galaxy containing hundreds of billions of stars, perhaps. So these are all so-called island universes. And the question is, um, when you're designing a telescope to look for these, these tiny uh, specks of light, you have to build a big telescope, like the Hubble telescope. Here's the Hubble, this image projected compared to the size of the moon. So you see it's a lot smaller than the size of the moon. It's a few times the diameter of this laser spot if you actually went outside and looked at it. 
Um, so if you imagine that there's about 5,000 galaxies in this image, then all you have to do to determine how many galaxies there are in the universe is count up how many laser spot sizes there are in the sky. So we'll do that in the remaining five minutes. No, we will not count it up. But you come up with 200 or so billion galaxies, each with 200 or so billion stars. It's quite astounding when you think about it. Now, Galileo wasn't looking for the deep field. His deep field was looking at, as Jay showed, these mountains on the moon, the craters on the moon. And he only required a very small telescope, about an inch or so aperture, I believe, was the diameter of his telescope. Nowadays, people wonder why, why do we need to build uh, a refractor when there are all these beautiful ref reflecting telescopes. Well, the key is that a refractor can actually provide a very large field of view. And, uh, and that's important in something uh, which is essentially a spyglass. So Galileo turned this tool uh, for the first time, arguably, uh, to the heavens. It didn't invent it, as, as Jay said. Um, but he turned it towards the heavens uh, uh, in 1609, and his science target was not the Hubble Deep Field or the cosmic microwave background, but something about the size of the moon. So his field of view is a few times the size of the moon uh, diameter, which is about a half a degree on the sky. My signal is many, many tens of degrees on the sky, and the fluctuations themselves are several times the diameter of the field of view that Galileo had. So Galileo's refractor won't do. The Hubble telescope won't do, as I showed you. And that's about the size of this laser spot, the field of view. To image this huge fluctuation in the sky, we need a very large field of view. And we designed that when I invented the so-called bicep telescope. I won't get into uh, why it's a pun and why it's so hilarious of a pun uh, to call this bicep. But nevertheless, I invented this telescope to go after the origin of those fluctuations, what actually caused it the theory of inflation. Here's a picture of it in California before he sent it down to Antarctica. And uh, I'll describe a little bit about what the telescope looks like uh, right now, what it does. As I said, the field of view of bicep is many, many times the, the field of view of the moon or the size subtended by the moon. So it's about 36 times the diameter of the full moon in one exposure, if you like. Our resolution only has to be about the resolution of the full moon. So it's actually convenient to build it in the form of a refractor rather than a reflector. Uh, here's what the guts of it look like if you have x-ray vision. You can look inside this telescope and you see this is a, this is a filter. Uh, and there are two lenses, an eyepiece lens and an objective lens. And then we have a series of detectors, not pupil pixels in our eyeball, but we have 49 spatial pixels. So we have, I like to call it, one, it sounds more impressive to say it's 1 20,000th of a megapixel. Um, so your iPhone has you know, 5 megapixels in it, 5 million pixels. This has 1 20,000th of a megapixel. So, but the advantage of this is that if you take your iPhone and you try to cool it down to negative 453 degrees Fahrenheit, it probably will avoid the warranty. So don't try that. So we have to cool down this telescope, and it's actually the universe's coldest telescope, as far as I know. I'm still waiting to hear back from, from outer Jupiter. Uh, but this telescope has been an operation and a variance of it for the past, uh, for the past eight years. And we're poised to really uncover the, the, um, the properties that cause this early universe, this property of inflation to exist in the universe. The lenses are made up, we just go down to the supermarket, and, no, we, we don't actually do this. We take the material is the same as a milk jug, high density polyethylene. We get a pure version of it, um, but we actually melt it and put it into the shape of a lens. We don't have to grind the lens, but we shape it in the shape of a lens and it's transparent to microwaves. And there's zero chromatic aberration that we have to make sure that it's anti-reflection coated. Galileo didn't have to worry about. Uh, but otherwise, it's a conventional refracting telescope. It's just big and very cold. The question is, where do you want to put such a telescope? This is the other uh, well-known refracting telescope. This is called the Yerkes Telescope in Wisconsin, shown on, a, on no doubt on the one or two days of summer that they get there when it was being built. Here's what it looks like inside. This is 40 inches in diameter. Bicep is 12 inches in diameter, the lens. Uh, and that's, again, this has a very, very uh, uh, narrow field of view compared to what BICEP does, and you tailor it to your science goals. So there's no sense in building a telescope bigger than what you need to accomplish your goals uh, because we don't have too many Medici's anymore. So where do we want to put it? We actually transported this telescope just as you would put a telescope that looks for optical light in space where it's dark or perhaps on Mount Palomar where it used to be very dark, and it still is relatively dark. Uh, we take this telescope where it's very cold, and so you may have guessed we're going to take it to the South Pole. Where's the South Pole? So if you go out into space and you look at the bottom of the world, uh, you'll see these giant signs that say, no, you'll, you'll look at Antarctica, and uh, the axis on which the Earth is rotating is shown there. That's the South Pole, and there's a North Pole too. But at the South Pole, Antarctica is a continent. The North Pole doesn't have any continental shelf. So if you build a telescope there, it'll float away. 
Uh, so that's not a great place to build a telescope, in contradistinction to the South Pole, which now has a wonderful station, and you can check the weather there, see what it looks like in a live webcam. It's, uh, the sun is up six months a year, and it's down six months a year. It's dark and cold. It can get to below 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of winter. So it's a spectacular place to go, despite the fact that if you do go there, uh, the natives are very unfriendly. Um, so, <laughs> so people always say, oh, penguins are so cute. Will you bring me back a penguin? So that's, that's illegal to bring back a penguin. But I will say, those of us who have trouble deciding when we go out to eat if we want chicken or fish, try penguin. It's really fantastic. Uh, so when you go there in Antarctica, there are no Walmarts, there's no Costco's, there's nothing like that to shop. So we have to buy all of our clothes, or not, we don't buy them, we get given to them by the National Science Foundation, every single article of clothing that we're going to need for the next, could be three or four months. Or if you're staying there for a full year, it could, be, it could be 11 or 12 months, and you'd have to take all the clothing that you see here, pack it in your bags, and then you get on one of these planes. You're looking at one-tenth of the New Zealand Air Force here. Uh, so, so this is a, a C-130 cargo plane that we sold to the New Zealanders, the Kiwis, and they fly us down. Unfortunately, we have to wear all of our extreme cold weather gear, those red parkas, in case we go down because we want to make sure that the sharks eat something warm. Um, uh, so it's really quite, quite uncomfortable. You sit knee to knee uh, inside this cargo plane, which is not designed for passenger comfort. This is first class. Um, you're sitting knee to knee with 50 other scientists for 11 and a half hours. Your meal is shown here, this brown paper bag, which sometimes has some version of meat or what used to be meat. Um, uh, there are no windows on the plane except for the cockpit. And the bathroom is a bucket, lovingly called the honey pot. Uh, and uh, when I went down, the first time I went down, I sat next to 11,000 pounds of bananas. And I never wanted to eat another banana after that. When you arrive at the South Pole, you actually transfer to a ski plane. Uh, and you land at the South Pole, which is about uh, 700 nautical miles from uh, the coast of Antarctica, where we flew into, and you see your telescope, which is the bicep telescope here. So this is sort of a photon's eye view, the last few uh, nanoseconds of a photon's life traveling across 13.7 billion years of the universe's history. It's going to travel and it's going to go right into that aperture of the refracting telescope down there. And there are other telescopes that we share the South Pole with. This is where you land, you get your bags, at the International Passenger Terminal. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the President's Club. This is the Admiral's Club. Uh, now, I took uh, you know, three hours to get there by, by military cargo plane. It took, it took about six months for the uh, heroic polar explorers to get there. This is what they would have looked like. They had to ski over frozen waves of snow called Sastrugi, um, which, which uh, for 700 nautical miles, up from sea level to 10,000 feet, carrying rocks and meteorites and, and all sorts of whale of, uh, of uh, seal fossils and all sorts of awful stuff. So he called it an awful place, especially since he got there and realized he was the second person there. So it'd be like we got to the moon and saw a Russian flag planted in the ground right at Tranquility Base. Uh, and that was because Amundsen's group made it there a few weeks earlier. And that difference of a few weeks cost them their lives uh, because they ended up freezing to death uh, in March of uh, 1912. Uh, nowadays, I say it's an awesome place, not an awful place. Uh, and this is the axis on which the Earth is rotating. It's, it goes from here, you drill all the way down, you come out the North Pole. It's quite astounding. Uh, so I can say I've run around the entire world, because I can make a lap around it. So you get there, it has a sauna, it has a greenhouse, a basketball court. It's a wonderful place to be. Great food, professional chefs who, who are assistants to celebrities, et cetera. It's a wonderful place. You, you go there, and you get all your gear on, and then you have to prove to your mother that you made it there, so you take a selfie. And then you start walking to work. You see your telescope off in the distance a kilometer away. So we walk to work, and we get there. Uh, and it takes a few minutes to get there. And it's not too unpleasant during the summertime. You have to realize the sun is just making a slow circle over your head all day long, slowly getting lower and lower each day until on March 22nd or so it sets below the horizon. It's quite, quite an unusual place to be. Um, this is our telescope. It's located in this building. Uh, the buildings are built up on stilts so that snow doesn't enclose them and bury the building over. Uh, and because of the fact that it's built up on stilts, there's no indoor plumbing. So this is our outhouse. And if you remember what the International Passenger Terminal looked like, you'll notice a resemblance um, uh, to our outhouse. So it took us a couple of weeks to, uh, to renovate the observatory, to install the telescope, to put in the refracting telescope that was last seen when it was in uh, California, to install it and then start taking images of the Big Bang. 
And through that, uh, we've obtained data for, uh, as I said, we obtained data for uh, on and off for the past uh, eight years. And this is a photo taken of the green flash uh, by our winter over Denis Barcats, the first year that we had the telescope operating. Uh, and you can see the green flash is real, and it lasts not as in a flash, it lasts, can last for an hour or more as the sun goes down, because it takes so long for the sun to slowly crest and then come below the horizon, moving, moving slowly as it does. And then it won't rise again for another six months. There's one day and one night per year. So we tell people, like our winter overs who spend the entire year there, the entire winter there, we tell them, you just have to stay for one night. <laughs> what have we obtained with, this, uh, with these data? We've been able to, uh, to make images that Galileo could never dream of, such as this and this. <laughs> so we take our images, we synthesize them, we make them into maps that are, as I said, the deepest images ever made of the early universe, the Big Bang. Uh, and we're looking for the imprint of inflationary gravitational waves in the Big Bang. So just coming back to this picture, one thing that we've been drawn to is that if we do verify that inflation occurred, that will some sense motivate what's called the multiverse theory. Uh, and this is that there's an infinite number of universes or a large enough number of universes effectively infinite. And if we were to uh, have such a universe as that, um, a lot of people say that that's tantamount to, to the quest for understanding a theological origin of the universe. So the question is, just as in Galileo's time, as Rene showed uh, the beautiful picture of, of Galileo and the Inquisition, so here he is there cowering. He is flexing his bicep, I'll note. Um, uh, but you know, I'd be I'd be like this uh, if I saw somebody uh, my my funding agent looking at me with a big stick or a sword or whatever. So just like in Galileo's day, uh, the 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 refracting telescope has done tremendously uh, important things to study our place in the universe and perhaps the future of the universe as well. So what will happen in the future? Stay tuned. Thank you. Wonderful. And um, now we will um, think about some of these, address some of these questions about what, just what this science is that Galileo uh, helped to put into motion and how it relates to uh, larger ways of thinking about uh, how scientific questions um, might be asked and what they might address. So Stephanie Judd. See if we can get. Um, thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much. This is really, really amazing. This uh, this occasion. So, um, the historian Carlo Ginzburg suggested in a very famous essay that in the beginning of human history there was only one paradigm for learning and knowing, a paradigm based on the senses. See, no, I think I, I have to learn how to, how do I, can somebody help me get the, the thing going, sorry. So, um, thank you, and then I do that, right? Okay. Or the space. Or the space, okay. <laughs> uh, the hunter was able to uh, learn and predict the location of prey based on the senses of vision and smell. Tracks in the mud, broken twigs, droppings, tufts of fur, uh, entangled feathers, lingering odors provided clues and evidence that could be smelled, registered, interpreted, and classified for the purposes of survival. The hunter, according to Ginsburg, could even tell a story based on the silent tracks left by the prey. A story, a narrative sequence, once upon a time, Something passed by here and went in that direction. Though our culture today is no longer that of the early human hunter, this way of knowing through the senses has never disappeared. Think in particular of the practice of medical diagnosis, uh, still, still based on the interpretation of symptoms. The physician listens to the wheezings of the lungs, uh, pays attention to smells, 
looks into ears, eyes, palpitates around organs, et cetera, et cetera, and on the basis of the senses, the physician diagnoses, tells a story, knows a disease or condition that is otherwise inaccessible. Physicians, psychoanalysts, detectives, and writers and scholars of the humanities and culture base our knowledge on, on the detection, observation, interpretation, and experience of clues. Unique details that lead to the cure of a disease, the discovery of unconscious desires, the solving of a crime, the elaboration of a fiction, or the construction of meaning. In each case, the researcher, like the hunter, registers, observes, deciphers, compares, classifies, and interprets these clues or symptoms and organizes a coherent narrative about them. The, result, the resulting story, and we just heard a wonderful story about research in the South Pole, it was very riveting. The resulting story is based on a physical experience and relationship, a relationship of the senses between a researcher and the subjects of research. It is shared through language and structured rhetorically. What happens to this research relationship with the introduction of scientific method? In the 17th century, a different paradigm or way of knowing emerged, a paradigm that we have come to associate with Galileo, whose birthday we celebrate today. Its principles included um, the, I, let's see, Yes, its principles included the rejection of any pre-existing pre authority, the freedom of research, the elimination of the single qualitative case from scientific knowledge, and a systematic and universal scientific method that was applied to repeatable phenomena for the purpose of pro producing quantifiable results. From the perspective of today, we might look back on this watershed moment in Western history and see it as a decisive fork in the road that defin definitively severed the scientific paradigm of knowing based on quantifiable results from the humanistic paradigm of knowing based on the experience of clues. But before we go down one road or the other, it might be important to point out that Galileo's new scientific way of knowing that has led us to so many marvels and discoveries in our contemporary world had much in common with and was indeed based in the earlier paradigm of knowing based on the senses. Observation, analysis, interpretation, comparison, classification, and experience were key to both the old methods of detection based on the senses and to the new methods of experimentation in the natural world. To experiment is to experience. To try, to test in both the sciences and the humanities. We might look therefore to the writings of Galileo himself to see how he, navig how he navigated this scientific turn, steeped as he was in the older paradigm. And I don't know if we'll get to uh, a biography of a cultural biography of um, Galileo, but he was a poet. He, uh, when he read the Divine Comedy, he went and took his, tried to measure what uh, the Inferno, what the measurements were of the Inferno. He was, um, he had many um, sketches of plays. He was, you know, he was, a, and he was a musician. He was trained by his father as a musician. In the autumn of 1618, uh, three comets appeared over the skies of Europe, sparking much debate uh, among scientists and philosophers about their origins. Galileo's uh, contribution to the debate took the form of a polemical dialogue published in 1623 and entitled Il Salgiatore, which is the term for a, preci a precise balance used by a goldsmith to measure gold, which is interesting. It's translated as a sayer in English, but I don't know that word in English. Galileo both uh, featured mathematical language in this work and polemicized against those who thought knowledge 
was like those fantasies uh, represented in literary texts, <laughs> underlining the distinction between scientific and humanistic ways of knowing. Yet, if we listen to one of the most famous passages in this work, we can see that Galileo was using the form of a literary fable or folktale to describe a man's aptitude for the new scientific research. And I heard some resonance in this uh, story uh, with um, the story in the South Pole. Okay. Uh, this is called, uh, sometimes called the, the fable of sound. Once, in a very lonely place, there lived a man endowed by nature with extraordinary curiosity and a very penetrating mind. His hobby was raising birds, and he enjoyed their singing very much. He observed with great amazement the device by which birds could transform the very air they breathed into a variety of sweet songs. One night, this man chanced to hear a delicate song close to his house, and imagining that it had to be the song of a, of a small bird, he set out to capture it. Much as the, uh, the bicep telescope set out to capture a certain kind of data. As the story goes on, the man, driven by his curiosity, goes out in the world to research new methods of making musical notes. He hears flutes, violins, organs, trumpets, and fifes, the squeaking of door hinges, the sounds made by wasps, mosquitoes, flies, and crickets as they beat their wings or scrape their wings together. With each ex experience of new sound-producing methods, Galileo invites us to partake in the man's amazement, curiosity, and aptitude for research. But as the man's wonder grows, and grew, or as the man's wonder grew, he felt more and more ignorant about how sounds were made. Finally, the man hoped to understand how a cicada sang, and manipulating or experimenting with it in his hand, uh, the man accidentally killed the insect. Galileo writes, the difficulty of comprehending how the cicada forms its song, even when we have it singing to us right in our hands, ought to be more than enough to excuse us for not knowing how comets are formed at such immense distances. I want to underline here that Galileo chose a form, a literary form, in order to express the tremendous opportunities and the sobering limits of scientific method. He may have polemicized against literary fantasies of the past in his introduction of scientific method, but this story suggests that he was also proposing new modes of understanding and exploration through literary forms. In any case, I think we can agree that Galileo was demonstrating with this story the importance of literary structure to the scientific enterprise. I would like to turn now to another passage in Il Saggiatore that illustrates how the human body and human language may also be key to relinking our humanistic and scientific paradigms. This is a somewhat complicated passage on the role of the senses in the study of sound and heat. As in the case of the story we just examined, Galileo is here again illustrating both how the scientific paradigm came to separate itself from the humanistic one, even as the two remained mutually interdependent. And he writes, in order to excite in us tastes, odors, and sounds, only quantities, shapes, numbers, and movements are required. I predict that if we take away our ears, tongues, and noses, the shapes, numbers, and movements will remain, but not the odors, tastes, and sounds. Once the living animal is removed from the picture, odors, tastes, and sounds become nothing more than nouns. Just as tickling is nothing more than a noun once you remove your armpits from the picture. This is, that was Galileo, yeah. 
The rhetoric of this somewhat humorous passage, <laughs> in my view, suggests two interpretive directions at once. On the one hand, it suggests that scientific method will ideally address the physics of sound and heat as independent and separate from the particularities of the human body. And I think it is also implied here instruments of measurement that will help the scientist to move past the limits and human, and human perception. On the other hand, it is important to note that this passage also suggests that once the human body and its perceptual affordances are, are removed from the field of research, we are left with language alone. In general, this language will be the language of mathematics, figures, shapes, numbers, algorithms, etc. And sometimes, and sometimes, this language will be comprised of nouns that have been emptied of meaning, as in the case of tickling without an armpit. But in both cases, we are left with concrete language, the study of which falls squarely under the purview of cultural and humanistic research. We tend to think that the study of concrete languages is implicated only in the study of social relations and structures, but not in science. Galileo here gives us an opportunity to consider language study to be also at the center of scientific method. And even as scientists move beyond the particularities of the body to measure large quantities of data, the centrality of language to scientific method ensures that scientific results remain connected to human ethics and values. Finally, I would like to turn to the question of metaphor in scientific method. Galileo's Il Saggiatore also famously gives us clues about how metaphor might play a role in a visionary charting of collaborative research between the sciences and the humanities and culture. Here, once again, Galileo both polemicizes against those scientists who limit themselves to ideas already contained in books, and at the same time, he takes up the metaphor of the universe as a book, a metaphor that was commonplace in the history of written culture long before Galileo's time. Um, and he, he writes, science, and he, he's uh, translating, the, I'm, I'm translating the term uh, philosophy, philosophia, as science because uh, Galileo actually thought what he was doing was natural philosophy. Uh, science is written in this very large book, I mean the universe, that is continuously open before our eyes but we can't understand it if we don't first learn to understand its language and the characters in which it is written. It is written in a mathematical language and the characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric shapes. Without knowing these characters, it is humanly impossible to understand the words. Without knowing these characters, science would just be wandering around in a dark labyrinth. And here's the the kind of the book that he was thinking about. And this is a, a Dante who made this metaphor very famous at the end of uh, Paradiso in the Divine Comedy. Um, here, Galileo makes it very clear that the scientific enterprise depends not only on language and writing with particular characters, but it also depends on metaphor. In particular, Galileo's metaphor of one very large book representing the universe implies that all experimental knowledge belongs in the book. As long as research is independent of pre-existing authorities, unfettered by disciplinary rules, and honestly measures the results of what can be known, such research meets the criteria of scientific method so it's not really just science that belongs in the book. Um, all all uh, research in our university meets the criteria and belongs on the pages of the universal book. To eliminate whole areas of knowledge from this book of the universe on the basis of our contemporary ideas of scientific method may be a distortion of the history of scientific method, 
but most definitely, in my view, limits our potential for breakthrough collaborative research between the humanities and sciences. I will conclude briefly with one more metaphor, this time from Galileo's father, Vincenzo Galilei, an influential music theorist and composer about whom we will soon hear more from our visiting musicians. In his dialogue about ancient and modern music, Vincenzo Galilei expressed his criticism in the area of vocal music. Uh, of poly he, was, he was critical of polyphonic or contrapuntal writing. He uses the metaphor of a Greek column and suggests that in the case of polyphonic vocal music, in which different musical parts move at different times and paces, the listener's attention is pulled in many directions at once. When singers sing together in harmony, it's as if, and I quote, two or three ropes have been tied around uh, a column, a Greek column, and two or three people are pulling in dif different directions with equal force. The column will not move from its base when singers sing together. <laughs> in contrast, when singers sing polyphonic music, we must imagine, according to Galilei, that the continuous push and pull of the column would bring it uh, crashing to the ground. The listener is now drawn from the sound of the music to the sound of the column crashing to the ground. This final metaphor of the crashing column is not just a rhetorical element to embellish a discourse, but actively creates an experience of image sound and meaning, and invites us to consider how we might concretely position ourselves today as researchers in science, creativity, the humanities, culture, and the arts, in order to hold up the column with science, metaphor, narrative, and recognition of human values and experience in our research. Thank you very much. Okay, Shlomo, let's see what you can do with that column. We're going to crash it. All right, thank you. So let me just get connected. Thank you. So first of all, it's a pleasure, and thank you for uh, having uh, having me today on this great occasion of talking about Galileo as the first scientist, and there's so much said about you know his musical uh, background, uh, and his family uh, background, and the influence that uh, music might have had. It was sort of implied, and, and and also the question of you know crashing these columns or these diverging paths between humanities and the sciences. So uh, I would like sort of present the one aspect we heard a lot about the telescope. But um, you know, the idea of uh, investing in periodic motion with the pendulum, I think, lies in, uh, in the core of some of the investigations that um, um, Galileo was actually charting. And um, in some sense, you know, the pendulum uh, is something we, we know, well, maybe not anymore because everything is electronic, but you know, your, your grandfather's clock might have had this little swinging arm and it would tick, and that tick wasn't done by a microphone or by a speaker. Uh, but the idea that Galileo actually measured or saw the swinging chandelier and was measuring its periodicity with its pulse, I think this idea, that, that very, very moment of linking your own pulse or your own senses to measure the time of a physical phenomena, I think something that uh, is worth noting. So. This whole talk is in some sense going to be about periodicity and phase. And phase basically means how things relate to each other. And the harmonies are related to relations between frequencies. So periodic motion is really represented in terms of you know, that swinging motion. And then you can see this as sort of a movement over time where the phase actually defines where you are. So um, in some sense, what we know about phases or about swinging is interesting because we encounter this in, in several different senses, uh, or we, we perceive this in different senses, and we encounter this in music in very different aspects. 
so we can listen to music and perceive this through our, and this is not an eye, this is our cochlea, uh, through, through our ear, and that will be the frequencies of the notes that we hear. And Galileo's father was actually uh, dealing a lot with tuning systems and theories about how you would basically choose the frequencies to express your scales and notes in which you write your melodies or harmonies or polyphonies. Or you could think about the rhythm, which would be way slower motion. And in some sense, we still think about this, if, at least intuitively, in different senses. So of course, periodic motion is something that exists in many uh, different uh, ways in the nature. And the waves, of course, are... Coma Bridge, Washington, opened only a few... Yeah, I'll, I'll just... Of ...over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge. So we have waves that mechanical engineers explore, and of course the, their frequencies are even lower than what the rhythm would be. But if you imagine this to be very fast movement, we might perceive this not as a periodic motion, we might perceive this as pitch, or as, as some other interesting phenomena that we could use as an instrument. So of course, these types of movements, uh, which are very drastic and can actually result in, in a final collapse of a bridge, uh, we sort of explore them artistically in, 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 in music. So the question is really, is this the same thing that we are listening to when we listen to notes and when we tap a rhythm? Is there such a thing as, as a pitch and rhythm continuum? And um, you know, one of the things that I would like kind of to um, suggest or explore today and offer you this glimpse into the world of you know, science slash music, because uh, a lot of you know, the research in music in some sense could be formalized in mathematical terms. And, um, uh, the idea of how time passes, or basically what are the different aspects of periodic motion or repetitions or phases of occurrence of events ha has had been really you know, challenging and fascinating composers. So uh, one of the modernist composers, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, who had been really at, at the advance of uh, you know, the modern music in the, in the mid of the previous century, uh, wrote this influential essay, How Time Passes, and basically he speaks about music that consists of order relations in time. This presupposes that one has a conception of such time. We hear alternation in acoustic field, silence, sound, silence, or sound, sound, and between the alterations, we can distinguish time intervals of varied magnitude. These time intervals may be called phases, and so on. So this, this idea of actually looking at the continuum of the vibration phenomena from very low frequencies to very high frequencies, of course, still limited by our senses, is what is unique about uh, some ways not only to look about and consider music, but also investigate into ourselves. I mean, how do we perceive? So uh, another snapshot from the same article, he actually shows two different ways of notating it. One is the harmonic series, which is on the bottom. And for those who are a little bit familiar with musical theory, they know that basically, if you look at multiples of frequencies, you get pretty much first you know, the octave, then you get the fifth, you get an, again an octave, you get a major chord, and as you go further up, you basically get many other notes, which might even sound dissonant when they're up, up there. On the other hand, if you consider times, you have this other notation, you, know, you have the whole note, the quarter note, the half note, and so on. And they're divisions of time. And in some sense, we do use both because our senses, in some sense, are separating the perception of these two different phenomena. But in some sense, I think it's interesting to consider what would be uh, a way to um, get that sense of continuity. So uh, instead of uh, just suggesting that there is this continuity, I would like to play a, a small excerpt where we start with uh, pulses and we accelerate them, okay? So that might sound a little faint in the beginning. Okay, so here we start with the clicks, just a second. Can we get the volume higher? Yeah, you can hear these clicks that gradually go and become pitch. And there is no definite reason why we would classify one as pitch 
in one of splits. But what is even more interesting is what happens if we consider relations or several rhythms together. So looking at the bottom, you know, uh, some of my fellow musicians, you know, professional performers would have difficulty actually tapping or, or playing this rhythm because it's so weird. You know, you have to count nine on the bottom. You have to count uh, whatever, eight on the middle row. And then you have these triplets on the, on the top. So it's quite an impossible rhythm. But then the question is, well, if we take these relations of rhythms and we speed them up, what would that sound like? Okay, so unless you look it up and you have the solution, ignore the name, but these are the rhythms. And it speeds up. And let's just jump a little forward, and, and you get a major chord, OK? So in some sense, uh, this continuity is really fascinating composers, because now you can play with this continuum of perception. And you know, Carl Stockhausen is, is known for several pieces, like Contacta is one of them, where he actually blends you know, traditional instruments with electronic band to sort of get that continuum. I mean, you can actually blur the boundaries. But these boundaries are actually different because we have different senses to perceive them. But the idea that there is some mechanistic principle, some way of going through and, and creating, you know, using the mechanics of a vibration or the mechanics of sound to create music which is so, sort of formal, and even the process of changing the, you know, the aspects of relations between different rhythms is purely mathematically by using, let's say, a pendulum as an idea uh, has been explored by, by musicians, you know, the 20th century experimental musicians. And uh, I would like to show some examples of how people actually take this idea of pendulum and use them in, music, in, in musical ways. So I would say one of the more famous examples is Steve Reich's pendulum music from 1966. And um, I'll just show quickly the setup. So we have multiple microphones and we have that resonating circuit that actually is the feedback loop that we all hate when it happens in, in the show. And, and this, is, this is an excerpt from, from the pendulum music of Steve Reich. So how long this music lasts? Well, until the, the, the laws of physics and motions bring it to a halt, right? It's through friction of air. But there is something very poetic in some sense to observe this phenomenon, listen to the rhythm, and the fact that it was not released together. There is the, that little phase change, these little changes in the rhythm, and as the piece progresses, we can actually get to some This is basically the idea of exploring physical processes or formal processes. And when we write computer programs that compose music, in some sense, we can emulate these processes. We might want to emulate or simulate or create uh, algorithms that actually create music 
which either is based on some physical effect or it could be based on something which is drawn from understanding of how our brain works, how our emotions are working. And in some sense, that's the same approach. I mean, the idea that you can create art out of equations and these equations can represent things which are either physical or, or humanistic is, is at, at the core of something that I think music has been interested in f from, from its inception. Because you know, the music of the spheres in some sense is, is, assumes that there is something musical in that harmonious behavior of nature and it can be expressed both ways. So, uh, so going back to this idea of phases and relations between phases, we have seen that one example where basically things move along the line of different frequencies relate. And of course, in our human uh, behavior or animal behavior, uh, we have these ideas of synchronous. So you could see like the ganger jumping, that's a synchronous uh, behavior. We have alternating feet when we walk. You can have um, basically phase shifts between different frequencies. And um, the idea that in music we actually explore this is interesting because the relations of, of frequencies is not only the fact of having harmonic relations that sound nice because somehow we use this overtone series, but also the deviations between frequencies is something that we are apparently uh, aware of and are sensitive to. So this is an example from uh, some research that um, I've been doing uh, where what we explore is actually the deviations between phases or the little jitter that happens between three harmonics. So if you can notice, I mean, these three lines, which represent different frequencies, are pretty much jumping all up and down together. They're synchronous, phase, phase coherent. While others up here are behaving independently. And then the question is, well, do we care? Well, apparently, yes. This is a very important property of several musical instruments or families of musical instruments that you, we can use some, uh, uh, some pretty sophisticated analysis tools which go beyond the frequencies, beyond the spectrum, or the so-called bispectrum, and they can detect this phase coupling. And apparently, different musical instruments have these different notions of how you know, the, the, the breadth of the sound that they produce how synchronized it is in phase. So trumpets would be, or synthetic sounds, like pulse strains, like this buzz sound is really phase synchronous. Well, if you take reverb, you add reverb, or you play you know, um, um, uh, string instruments, woodwinds a little bit, they have unsynchronous phases that makes it a little bit sweeter, a little bit more softer sound, and we actually use these rules for orchestration. So uh, one, th one other interesting development, which I think kind of links the question of our perception to the questions of laws of physics and how we can use this for, for the arts, is something that you know one of uh, Galileo's uh, followers, if I, if I may say, uh, and you know, a person who was uh, on Mersenne's network we've seen before, uh, so this is uh, Christian Huygens, uh, who was exploring the pendulum, or he actually is credited as inventor of the pendulum clock, and uh, Viviani had a lot of arguments because he claimed that Galileo was the first one to invent it. He actually discovered this uh, effect of what he called odd, odd kind of sympathy. He wrote this to letter to the uh, Royal Society of Science. And the idea is that pendulums actually tend to synchronize. So it's very interesting to see how pendulums could be actually used as, as a musical tool. Uh, so before maybe jumping into, into the idea of uh, synchronizing pendulums, let me play an excerpt from another piece, which is also very uh, influential or interesting uh, milestone in, 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 the, in the idea of using processes as, as, as a poetic form. And this is Georgi Ligeti's you know, fancy name, Poem Symphonique, 400 metronomes. So here there is still no coupling, but just to show you the richness of the phenomena of, of a metronome, which is basically a pendulum, uh, and how it behaves. So the idea is actually to set up these metronomes and let them go.
Now this piece can be played for an hour. This version is only uh, about 15 minutes long, I think. I'll skip to the end. You wind them differently, so you want them to die. And, and they're also tuned slightly to different tempo. Uh, but you can imagine you know, the magnitude of these 100 clicking metronomes, especially in a space that has a lot of reverb. And as the piece progresses, basically you the weakness, these metronomes slowly st starting to die because the screen basically goes off. And as we go on, we have less and less of these clickings until this whole thing basically disappears and you're left with one metronome still kind of fading out. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll leave this to your uh, questions or interpretation or your own thoughts. Why this is, a, a, you know, a symphonic poem to basically 100 mechanical ticking elements and what is, what is the art part of this? But I think a very interesting phenomena is, uh, is the idea that metronomes don't have to be independent. And if, uh, and this is a little setup that I've brought here, I'll just demonstrate this briefly and I'll show the video of this very interesting phenomena that if we have two metronomes which are, which are set on slightly different uh, tempi, okay, and we let them go, They'll go out of phase, but now you can notice they start moving. When they're put on this platform that has basically a speed of movement, there is a coupling. It takes a while. I'll let you play with this during the break. But eventually what we get is to the point where even though they're different tempi, they get together and they sing together. So uh, here is a brief example of this synchrony or synchronicity that has this very interesting phenomena that you know the more metronomes you put, the faster they synchronize. And it has to do with uh, onsets of cows and very interesting other physical phenomena. And the funny thing is that the same experiment that Higgins did when I was kind of looking up for some materials uh, preparing for this lecture, you know, I even found out that there were papers published on this <laughs> like two, two years ago. There's one from two, or 2009, 2006. People actually like, make simulations trying to understand this phenomena. <laughs> So this is really a fascinating question of how the, what happens that suddenly things in nature bind together. And maybe in the trumpet we have the different frequencies, the different partials bind together, while in others they don't. And there is an interesting relation of what, what makes us you know, like one and in what cases we prefer the other one. So here's a short example of these, uh, I think, 32 metronomes clicking in different so it's very much like the Ligeti's poem symphony for metronomes, but I think it has a little edge, which to me it's, it's even scary sometimes to see how they all suddenly sync together. So I'll move slightly forward. And they start getting more and more together. And the minority has to comply. And, and the basis for this is that the whole platform is actually shaking. And eventually, you get this fully steady. You have no intervention, nothing. Now imagine that this is your creative tool. You can basically play with these ideas. You synchronize things, you let them out of phase, you let them behave separately. And the whole idea, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting, you know, what, what Stephanie said about, you know, the quote from uh, Galileo's father. The idea of whether polyphony is good or bad, whether these things should cohere together and have perfect harmonies, or should we have separate voices? So, you know, we learn from Bach that we actually should write polyphony. We should have different voices and that every voice has to have its own melodic line so you could sing it solo. While you know, in, in, in a lot of modern music, uh, you have so many lines you cannot follow them anymore, or you can have homophony, which is just chords and chords and chords and rhythms and rhythms repeat. And it's interesting that we kind of play with these, with these notions of, of synchronicity and break from synchronicity as, as, as a tool for understanding music. So um, speaking about music research, one evident application of these synchronized uh, pendulums is in beat tracking. And uh, one of our students actually is working on, 
on ways of doing bead tracking. I mean, this is a snapshot from commercial software that actually allows the computer to find the beats and create this pattern because it's, it's really a basic tool. If you want to improvise with your computer, you want it to, to be on the beat with you, you want to edit stuff, you need actually to know where the beats are to be able to manipulate the tempo. Well, the other one, which is related to that previous example of phase coherence in, in, in musical instruments, you can actually classify musical instruments into these categories where you have the, the brass instrument outside and you have basically the wood, you have the, the woodwinds and you have the strings which have the least amount of coherence. So I think the idea of emergence of synchronized patterns is, is really something powerful that um, relates to a lot of you know, things that we as artists want to ex explore, but it also relates to the way we as listeners have to sink in or have this odd kind of sympathy with, with, with artistic work. So in some sense, the, the one take home message could be, uh, or I would like you to take home, is that you are part of that experiment. So when, when you listen to music or you listen to scientific presentation or you can listen to, you know, to poetry, you sync up with this thing. You have your own oscillators, you have your own pendulums, and, and they have to, to work in sync. Otherwise, you'll be ticking your clock and somebody else will be ticking his. All right, thank you. That's wonderful. Now maybe the um, uh, panelists can come up and uh, sit at the uh, table here and we'll do uh, 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 some questions and a little discussion. We're, um, we're only 20 minutes behind schedule. But, um, and if people are needing to uh, leave uh, for the restroom or whatever, we're, we're routing people out this side door. Um, been a little accident on, the, on this side, so um, go ahead and go that way. Okay. Yeah. Even though yeah, so even though we are running a little bit late, we will start the uh, musician program at five. Um, so it'll just we'll just take a little bit of time out of our out of our break here. Um, so uh, so maybe I would just ask. Um, I kind of have two, I have two questions maybe for the panel to reflect on a little bit, and and um, one one has to do with this um, uh, I, this this Galileo as being this you know found this fi figure of the scientist of this first scientist, and um, and I think a big part of that um, had to do with. Uh, how you know how how he was as a person, how he was situated in his social context, and also a bit about the, his own story and his own myth um, that Galileo, was, in a way, was uh, martyred for his beliefs. Um, so you know we have a lot of other scientific figures that are coming up at that time, but I don't know if any of you have any views on that are more biographical about. Uh, um, how he was able to kind of carve out this role of being a scientist in a society that, you know, that wasn't really quite a familiar. He, you know, he, he didn't have the same kind of historical uh, uh, precedents to build upon with that. And aspects of that may have been led to what kind of, you know, got him in a bit of trouble later on as he tried to make that way for himself in the world. Um, so what do, what do you think about that? His, and then his resulting martyrdom as a way to kind of make for a good story. Um, Stephanie? <laughs> well, I, I'm not an expert on Galileo, but I have been really interested in what I've been reading. And I feel that um, Galileo was not a scientist. We made him a scientist. We took a part of what he, uh, of his great accomplishment, and. Uh, separated it out from the whole. So Galileo was uh, uh, someone who was a different kind of a thinker. He thought that, uh, that we shouldn't um, have to uh, worry about uh, pre-existing authorities or what was already published, that we should be independent thinkers. And so he actually launched a whole new way of thinking that applies to uh, um, thinking across the, the fields of learning. It's not just about science, that it's really about uh, learning. 
and that we all have uh, benefited from it, and that when we separate out him as a scientist, uh, then we get into trouble because he was not, he was more uh, integrated and holistic in his cultural impact. Thanks. <laughs> Renee, do you look like you have something um, to say on this? I have lots of things to say about that. I mean, I think Galileo, um, I mean, he's a very, com I don't know if people can hear me. I think he was a very combative person. I mean, he fought with his mother, he fought with his family, he fought with the Jesuits, with everyone that he wrote against. And um, one of the things he tried to do was make himself be different. I mean, he was at the court trying to be entertainment. So one of the ways that he did that was being very combative and tried to set him off himself off as embracing a new method. Um, which today we look at as being scientific. Um, but I think many people in his own time read Galileo and thought he was very important, but they actually read him, um, they apply the methods to Galileo, not scientific methods, even famous people, um, you know, that we would think of as being scientists, like Christopher Wren, they often read Galileo as if he was sort of a regular old philosopher of the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's only in retrospect that we look at him as being a scientist. and. I think Viviani helped a lot with that. I mean, he creates these legends of Gallo being experimentalist, um, preserves the papers we want, and, and so we've sort of created this myth about Galileo that partly he, he, he wanted to create a, a similar myth of being very different, but I don't think he was as different as we, want to, as we tend to think that he is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and maybe one of the things that I think um, kind of leads to the second question, and then I'll take questions, we'll take questions from the audiences, is, is that is extraordinary about how, uh, how, how he thought was to, was to think uh, with kind of radical perspectives on things like um, sense of scale, um, which I think is, you know, what we, and I think we saw a couple of wonderful examples of, of simply that factor of taking scale relationships and from one domain and radically extending them or applying them to another domain. And I think Shlomo gave us a pretty uh, visceral experience of the relationship of that in, um, in sound. And um, Brian is showing how that uh, can possibly work when we try to think about the history of the entire universe or, or universes, um, which he was just alluding to at the end of his talk. And so there's, you know, maybe something about uh, uh, the ability to think in that way, which is you know, maybe still not a, a typical way uh, in which we you know, pose problems. Um, so maybe the question back to you all is um, uh, to reflect a little bit about you know, these ways of, of, of just the notion of how questions might be framed at, in different periods of time and how Galileo help to give us an example of the way of framing questions that might produce radical insight. I think the point is very interesting that we took Galileo, part of Galileo, and elevated him to the role of a hero. Uh, I chose to spoke about Ger Galileo's Hedirus Nuncius from 1610, and I showed only the frontispiece of his dialogue, Dialogo, Dialogue of the Two World Systems, Copernican and uh, Ptolemaic, in, uh, in 1632, but uh, that dialogue was carried out over several days, uh, what we would call chapters, but the arguments were in several days, and one of the days he argued very forcibly, forcefully, f forcibly, he argued very forcibly about his theory of the tides, uh, and he was just wrong. So he was not always right, and, w and we choose, and he was argumentative about pushing his theory of the tides, but it just, just doesn't make sense to 21st century uh, eyes and ears. Uh, so certainly we are choosing to take what we choose from a very complex figure. Hagiography almost to mix metaphors <laughs> um, <coughs> with Galileo, the, the story I don't know if it's or not, that at the end of the fight, so that he had it moved during the... Uh, well, supposedly that was what he said after, after he was condemned in 1616 right. when he had to say that uh, that the earth was still and that he was wrong right. and the story is that he then went out right. and, but it's not known and really said that but yes, sure yes. yes nevertheless we have him as this iconoclast this rebel who you know, has been counteracting the most powerful force of the day in the Catholic Church so yeah 
Yeah, it's a mixture of legend, I think. Um, do we have a mic that's roaming the audience? Uh, so, for example, Brian, I don't know if you wear socks or not, but we all know that Einstein didn't wear socks. So we've chosen aspects of his personality. Oh, so, so maybe we don't have a mic, so I'll, I'll rephrase questions into the mic. Um, yeah, go ahead. So the question I will just con concatenate is <laughs> generally about multiverses, their nature and evidence that might exist for them. And I think that mic, I'm not sure if that mic is actually working, so maybe you could borrow Jay's. Yeah, so I usually get asked that question in the context of, I have a simple question to ask you. It's the nature of string theory in the multiverse. <laughs> uh, so it's very challenging to, to address those questions. I briefly flashed before my inquisitor put up the sign that I had no more time left. Uh, I briefly flashed a quote from Paul Davies, who at best is agnostic and is maybe an atheist, but he describes a situation um, that's now more or less being faced by scientists, cosmologists like he and, and others uh, like myself who study things experimentally, that string theory and the theory of inflation seem to have a natural prediction of baby universes, if you like. Universe used to mean when I was a kid, it meant everything that there possibly could be uh, you know, throughout anything. Uh, now it tends to mean our local uh, region of something that could be much, much larger, encompassing 10 to the 120th, uh, one with, with 120 zeros after it, or maybe 100, 10 to the 500 power of different universes, of which ours is just one, and maybe the laws of physics are different in every universe, but in, uh, in, in our particular universe, in certain universes, it may arise that the laws of physics are fortuitously arranged such that we you know, have, we'll have cosmologists and, and centers for imagination and, and all sorts of things like that where people can contemplate the universe and, and perhaps something bigger than the multiverse. So right now, the quote ends with a very, as I say, he's an atheist agnostic um, a theoretical cosmologist, and he says, these considerations of whether or not there are universes beyond the vision of our telescopes, even my refracting, powerful refracting telescope, um, uh, is simply untestable. Uh, and until we have more motivation, either for string theory, and I hope and I think there'll be more ev evidence for inflation, uh, the jury is still out. And we really need to, to expend more energy to understand whether or not string theory is true and whether or not inflation is true. There are two different paths that seem to be pointing in the same direction. Good. And then um, uh, maybe the woman in... So the, que so the question from a uh, recovering PhD and MD uh, <laughs> is uh, locating, putting some context on our very my small moment in, uh, hopefully this small moment in the middle of human history. <laughs> and a and, uh, question about the the scientific method as the method, the, the capital T method of truth um, that we seem to be celebrating. Um, is, it, is this just a moment that 500 years from now, and that's talk, let's not talk about 30, billion, 30 million years, but 500 years from now, we'll look back on and think of in the same way as the Catholic Church in relationship to Galileo.
Well, science is a word. We've already seen it redefined here. We saw a natural philosophy substituted for science up, uh, up on the screen. So, uh, so what I'm defining science is, uh, as is the method by which we find things. And if we follow the scientific method by which means we find the, we follow as best we can the smartest reasoning that humanity is capable of, then we will always remain on the top of our game by counting on what our scientific conclusions are. I think we need some more input on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a way oh. of communicating with one another where someone in Italy could communicate with someone in Heidelberg or in London, whereas that was very hard to do with the subjective kind of quality imposed, for example, by space. Mr. Burton is saying it's a way of communicating. I think he otherwise can't be heard in the back, that somebody in Heidelberg communicate with somebody in London, uh, I'm quoting, and in which we can carry statements as well as possible. I think people, people communicated before Galileo. They just had a very different uh, methods and goals of studying the natural world. So their method of communication was following the principles of Aristotle. So I mean, I would say that yes, that in 500 years or 1,000 years, well, people will look back and think that we've made a mistake. I mean, or we, are, we were sort of on the wrong path. That, I mean, people have always been trying to understand the natural world, but the, the methods they chose to use and the goals that they embraced have changed over time. And so I think some of our, the things that we do sort of specifically will, will, people will think are crazy, but maybe might even reorient the goals. I don't know how it would be changed. But. And I would say that Renee is obviously not a professor of science. <laughs> okay. And I am a professor of science. And as a professor of science, I would say I would stop immediately what I'm doing if I thought what she said was true, that we are searching for truth. We may not get there. We may not have, have all the answers. But what we think we are doing is finding out reality. And we certainly believe that everything we deduce now will prove to be true for the rest of time. I, they did too before Galileo. <laughs> we just have changed the method. So I'm not saying that we're, but we also changed the goals. I mean, people before Galileo had a different goal. So they were also trying to find the truth. I would, I would like to add that um, in relation to the question is that um, one of the things that, you, many things blew my mind uh, listening to all these talks, but one of them was to think about um, what, how to uh, bring together the history of the universes, the multi-universe, the multiverse, and the kind of history that we um, practice as humanists, and that one isn't really, uh, shouldn't exclude the other. And they're very hard to bring together. So I think it's true that we are, um, uh, that we need to bring them together, because there has to be a way to, um, to bring the uh, scientific, um, capacity that we have that which which is just phenomenal to uh, back not back but to our ethical and human concerns with language and living together so that's what I, would say. And I think Shlomo had a so I would like kind of to take on this uh, pretty much uh, dilemma or debate or the idea that we don't agree actually on, on the differences between the scientific method and, and, and the humanistic method uh, as I think a very powerful uh, thing to keep on disagreeing. <laughs> because I think one aspect is really this, the scope or the scale. And I think, Sheldon, you mentioned the question in the previous question, the question of scale. I think it's easy to do scientific experiment when you speak about macro or micro. So you, like you look at galaxies far away, or you look at, 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 at you know, whatever, this microscopic level. But when you deal with things on the mezzo level, which means like the same scale as yourself, that's where the little fluctuations matter, and that's where your measurement instrument, which is you as a human body, the brain, or whatever the senses, interferes with the experiment. So I think in that sense, there is a problem that we, in some sense, cannot really make this reproducible result methodology work for a lot of the humanities, because once you do that, everything changes immediately. So I think there is this aspect, you know, even, you know, here we, we deal mostly with physics, uh, which is really a science that you know assumes that there is there is an underlying objective theory, but I mean whether it's unified or not, I mean you know uh, whether whether you know Descartes was um, 
um, accusing Galileo of being more too polemic versus scientific. Well, I think there is this other notion of what we're looking for. And, and in some, some places people mention that this, this term, which I think is also very powerful, of aesthetic ideal. And aesthetic ideal is not necessarily in the arts. It's somehow the way you perceive the world. And the fact is that the church not only forbid Galileo from thinking whatever he was thinking about the earth and, and, and revolving around the sun and stuff like that, but also they were you know, coding the roles for, uh, for voice leading and, and, and counterpoint. You had to preserve certain harmonies because the world is supposed to be divine and, and, and led by some principles. And we're still in the scientific method. We try to simplify things. We try to uh, get them un unified. But you know, if you look at, at uh, the age of intelligent machines or what we do with computers trying to compose music or any kind of artificial intelligence, we don't have the way to test. The test is really the Turing test, which means that if this machine can basically um, um, disguise itself as human, that's intelligence. And that's the scientific achievement, which means take something which is not scientific, pretend that it's scientific, and that's your achievement. So I think we have some very deep questions when once we start dealing with science on the level of, of people who need actually to address these results. And ours has been dealing with this all the time. So I don't think we have a solution to this question. Let's see, there was some, some more questions over. Oh, we have a mic. Perhaps you could tell us, uh, and I have a particular example in mind, what he thought about some of his contemporaries, particularly you must know about what he wrote when he was a, at Pisa um, as a faculty member about clothing styles oh, okay. at Pisa. Do you know this story? I don't know. I can't hear what I'm talking about. Well, I just, I, I ran across it. He was very uh, um, unorthodox about not wanting to wear the academic garb, and he wrote a, a poem, a long poem about it, um, in which he, uh, it was very, um, they uh, say it's like um, Berni, the poet, this, this very burlesque type of uh, body poem. I mean, that's what I know. He said only doctors should, they, they taught wearing togas yeah, yeah. at Pisa. Mm -hmm. And he said only doctors should wear gowns, not professors. <laughs> And as a reward for writing this, they, they threw him out. <laughs> so we'll do, uh, uh, we'll do maybe just one last question. I know we could go on for hours. But we'll have, we'll have people, we'll all be around in the reception in the hallway to, um, uh, to further the discussion. Uh, well, I had a question, which is that there's been a lot of discussions, which I think go back to Husserl, but in the last 30 or 40 years, especially stimulated by Noam Chomsky, what's called the Galilean style, sometimes also called the Newtonian style. So. On the one hand, we of course have the context of Renaissance humanism, but when people talk about science and the modern way of inquiry, uh, they talk about the Galilean style, and I was wondering if some of you could comment on that, um, since we're here celebrating Galileo's 450th birthday, and since Newton and others were so inspired by Galileo, and I think that there is something specific to it, and it seems that we're kind of circling around that, so I was wondering if some of you could comment on that. Uh, I don't know how specific I can be, but <laughs> uh, I would say that there's a famous quote, I forget who says it, but, but you know, the most common thing that defines you know, a scientist's daily life, you know, people always think, oh, you're a cosmologist. You know. Besides asking me, you know, what's it like to study the uh, hair and nails and, and give perms to people, they ask me, uh, what, what is, um, what's it like to you know, contemplate the universe all day? Well, I don't get to do that, unfortunately, every day. Uh, it's not quite as grand as doing that. Um, but when I do have the best uh, uh, engagement you know, of my life, it's as in, in a career sense, it's when I find something that's completely unexpected. It's the serendipity that I find, I don't know if Jay would agree with me, I mean, the few times in my life where I've truly discovered something new and realized well, I'm the only person on planet Earth, to my knowledge, that knows this, it's actually been terrifying because science is often defined by consensus, a set of facts in which multiple people will agree and test and verify. Um, when you don't know that you're, what you've conjectured or what you've discovered is real, quote unquote real, 
um, it can be uncomfortable. Uh, and you know, uh, having that opportunity comes around very rarely. Uh, so in a practical sense, um, you know, one of the most frequent things that we encounter is not, Eureka, I've verified my scientific hypothesis that you kids probably learn as the scientific method. Um, you know, we don't really do that, right? It, it's kind of a fable that we tell to, to, to kids when they're in school. Keep doing it, by the way. It's good for <laughs> ninth grade biology. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's usually, wow, that's really weird. What, what, this doesn't make any sense. And then teasing out the information that nature is trying to hide from us is what's really exciting. The uh, story is that Hans Bethe, when he figured out the nuclear reactions that made the stars shine, uh, took that night his, uh, his girlfriend out and she said, aren't the stars beautiful tonight? And he said, yes, and I'm the only person in the world who knows what make them shine. <laughs> but, but then we saw the pictures of the comet that Galileo studied. So I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not a cosmologist, I'm a cometologist. <laughs> Good. Well, well, we'll leave it with that. And I know there's more questions, and I'm sure they're all brilliant. And let's talk out in the lobby. Th thank you, all panelists, for and thank you for coming. And come back at five o'clock for the concert. Seth Lehrer, and I'm the dean of arts and humanities here at the University of California, San Diego. And it's such a privilege and an honor to play a role in the Arthur C. Clarke Center and in this celebration of Galileo's 450th birthday. Uh, before I introduce our musicians in ordinary who will be playing music from the age of Galileo, uh, I want to ask you all to acknowledge the work of Sheldon Brown and the Clark Center staff for this remarkable day. For those of you that are not regular attendees at UCSD events, I hope you recognize that part of our mission in Arts and Humanities is not just to provide the community and the campus with artistic experience or with entertainment, but to challenge the imagination and to build bridges between Arts and Humanities on the one hand and science and technology on the other. And the Clark Center and many of our other uh, institutions here at UCSD are doing precisely that. Galileo, in his own way, as we saw, was an individual who himself bridged the sciences and the arts, natural philosophy and the human imagination, who looked both towards the stars and inward to his own soul. And there is no question in my mind that if he were alive today, he'd have tenure here. and we would get Mersenne to write the letter of recommendation. <laughs> the musicians in Ordinary are a remarkable duo of Hallie Fischler-Varette and John Edwards, soprano and lute, who have been playing historical music now for several decades together. They're based in Toronto. They are the musicians in residence at St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. And they came, uh, they're no strangers to the UCSD campus. They came last year. I was teaching a wonderful undergraduate course in Shakespeare. And they came to a visit. They taught a class for us in the music of Shakespeare's time and gave a wonderful performance. And they illuminated to the undergraduates in my class the way in which Shakespeare was not just a poet, but himself a musician of the spoken word. What they're going to offer today and the next hour is the music of the age of Galileo. I don't know how many of you are able to pick up an actual program. Um, it's not essential, but I hope what you'll recognize is that they're giving us an entire spectrum of music leading up to and after Galileo. Galileo's father, as we were told many, many times, was himself a great musician and music theorist. And part of our goal in having them perform today is to give you a sense of what the sonic world was, what the musical world, the world of the human and the instrumental was in the 16th and early 17th centuries. I hope all of you were able to find your way here in a timely way. I hope all of you were able to get a snack. And I welcome all of you to this wonderful performance by the musicians in ordinary. And with that, I hope they are in a listening distance so they will know that this is their cue to come on stage.
quasi-improvised uh, his canzona, we really were sung, uh, so to the, to, to the accompaniment of a plucked string. Um, uh, um, the uh, poet in Beowulf probably sang to his crowd, and the poet uh, Homer sang to his lyre. Uh, so singing quasi-improvised, uh, uh, singing poetry to quasi-improvised pre-existing tunes has been, had been around for uh, yonks. Um, but we chose to put these lines from uh, Ariosto um, to this particular uh, uh, Ottava Rima that's in the, Bart the Cosmo Bartagari's loop book, this textless tune, because uh, uh, Galileo was very fond of him, and Gal Galileo, the literary critic, which was another one of his hats that he wore, was a great champion of Ariosto. He thought he had lots of invention and was, was interesting, and not that Tasso is turgid and boring, let's face it. Um, but, um, and in fact, uh, John Heil Heilbron, uh, uh, who's just written a biography of, of Galileo, suggests that he thought, ooh, maybe those are mountains on the moon, because in Ariosto, uh, there is a passage where there are indeed mountains on the moon. So with that, that, that one thing, that you'll hear a few of those throughout the day, you'll hear part songs that are this polyphonic, some will be more polyphonic than the Becky you just heard, and then there's the new music, which, um, Vincenzo Galileo, uh, Galilei, uh, with his, uh, uh, was in, uh, instrumental in starting this new vocal form, you might say, but he probably wouldn't. <laughs> and, and so, unfortunately, Vincenzo, though he wrote lots of um, re uh, 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 theory about, um, aesthetic theory about the, uh, about the new music that, they, that Perry and Caccini were developing, uh, none of his none of his music. He has some polyphonic madrigals and he has some loop pieces, and you'll hear one thing that maybe he composed a bit later. Uh, but none of his. If he wrote this in the new in the new music style, this declamatory new dramatic style, we don't have any. We have uh, lots of his loop works that don't. I could also tell you about um, 
uh, his uh, polemic with uh, Zarlino about whether singers in ensemble, vocal ensembles are using the diatonic, uh, syntonic uh, form of tuning or the intense syn uh, syntonic. But A, I clearly don't understand it because I'm not really sure I've got that right. And B, uh, it's probably best to do, to, uh, done with diagrams and, uh, and um, uh, ratios. Uh, but you'll see the frets get closer as they get up, uh, go up the neck. And that's each fret is 1 18th of the remaining string length. And uh, through his studies in geometry and proportion, Vincenzo is the first to do that. So when you go home and play your ukuleles, doing some George Formby or something tonight, that, that's who you should be thanking for your ukulele playing in tune. This, so now I'm going to play three, um, three little pieces dedicated to the muse of the muses of this one's um, astronomy, lyric poetry, because um, uh, Galileo was also uh, did also write poetry and uh, was a literary critic and uh, music.
the next, so the next one in the back of uh, one of uh, Vincenzo Galilei's uh, uh, own uh, book, uh, printed books, Ages of Dialogue, are a bunch of his own, his, uh, his own, and a couple of other people's uh, polyphonic madrigals uh, r r arranged for the one lute and one voice, but the voice is a bass voice, and Halley's doesn't sound so good singing in that range, so we're not going to do those ones. And also the not the new music that he in all of his printed uh, things where he says, "Oh, the polyphonic madrigals, who's that? What's that all about?" They're also the quite old-fashioned. In the back there is our, and it's strange. Why would a, a professional musician of that time need to write this out? He sort of writes out the chords for a ground bass, or do some chord changes for a popular ground bass called the folia, and then he. Uh, it, but they're sort of they've got set rhythmically. It's written out in the loop tablet, which tells you where to put your fingers. And there's no tune, and it says, uh, for a sonnet. And you can sort of, more or less, fit a sonnet into these rhythms that he's written, written out. So we chosen one of Galileo's sonnets to do, to put into it, um, uh, to put into his dance. We, we, we would say it was reconstructed, a reconstructed. We found the folia tune from one of the many other sources, uh, you can decide this if this is music or a poetry reading or somewhere in between. <laughs> or nothing at all. You might decide that. <laughs> Just don't tell us We put it all, thing. yeah, we don't want to know. <laughs> we just like it's Galileo and Galileo. <laughs>
so next I'm going to play probably the most polyphonic piece on there. You'll hear all the voices coming in different parts and coming in. And then we're going to play a piece by, uh, a, a text by Petrarch who invented the Renaissance. <laughs> Overgeneralization, but you know. Um, uh, uh, set by Perry. Uh, now, contemporaries of Perry uh, and Puccini uh, said that um, uh, Puccini's uh, solo madrigals, they call these things, uh, like Amarilli, is more, has more grace, but Perry was more true to the rhythm and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the emotional uh, uh, baggage, I'm going to call it, of the uh, um, of the text, and who has more emotional baggage than Petrarch? Not many, not many of us. He's just as well. Um, so you'll hear, and I think I think you'll agree with me that um, that, that, that this still sounds like a, quite a, a quite a novel. It is really a new music to us uh, when we hear the parrot. If I ever shut up. <laughs> Thank you. 
they do the same. Here's another Romanesca. Um, <laughs> uh, everybody did a variations on a, a Romanesca at the time. It was uh, 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 the Baroque. If you've seen a Baroque building, it's this big structure that's very organized, and then there's all this little decoration about it. Well, that's what this piece you're about to hear is too. intestines, right? So it's very likely that this, this, it, when the sheep ate some lovely green grass over here and some horrible nasty brown grass over here. And so they're not going to be of equal diameter all the way down. So a lot of it is theoretical. And you also have lutenists who aren't really tuning all that carefully. So I don't know if it's really <laughs> all this, all this stuff. I would also have to say, I think it's a lot moister inside of a sheep than it is in this room. Yeah, that's right too. <laughs> Why not, why not check that at home tonight with a lamb chop? <laughs> okay, this is a very sad song, so I can't. Talk about
Oh, dear. 